Hey folks, this is the Yaku Cosmopolitan. Welcome to the 2023 Nippon Professional Baseball regular season recap. The regular season ended last night as the Lotte Marines defeated the Rakuten Eagles in a do or die game. They were able to leapfrog themselves into second place. If they had lost, they would have missed the playoffs, but uh, that was basically kind of an early playoff game because there was so much at stake. But uh, the 143 games for every team is finally complete, and now we're going to be entering the playoffs. So today I want to review every team's regular season, talk about some standout performers who overperformed, who underperformed, things like that. And we'll begin in reverse order of the standings, uh, starting with the Pacific League. So the Hokkaido Nippon Ham Fighters finished in last place with a 60, 82, and 1 record. They only had a negative 32 run differential, uh, but we look here and they had a losing record against every team. Uh, most importantly, they were 9 and 16 against the Cebu Lions, which was basically the difference between them being in last place versus fifth place. We look here at their record by month. They started out really slow. Uh, 9 and 16 in March and April. Then they had a pretty good string uh, of, of months here with May and June, you know, right around 500. But then July was just terrible. 5 and 16. I think they had like a 12 or 13 game losing streak in there that ended their season hopes. August was strong and then they finished uh, really poorly as well in September and October. Uh, another thing I've noticed with the fighters is. You know, this is their uh, run scoring and runs against breakdown by inning. First inning, second inning, third inning, fourth inning uh, down here. Top row is runs scored, bottom row is runs against. They outscored their opponents in each of the first four innings. It's the last part of the game here, innings five through nine, where they were outscored. So I don't really know how much that tells you about the team. I guess, you know, they, they start out hot, but then... Um, they're unable to, to finish the job. Part of that is that, you know, their bullpen's not very deep, but uh, for a young, inexperienced team, it also shows you that, you know, th th they have the right pieces there. You know, for half of the game, they're winning, but then things fall apart. So uh, maybe Tsuyoshi Shinjo and, you know, the, the young core that the fighters have can take a big step next year. Because we look over here at, at the baseball reference page, uh, there's some young players here that had really good years. And keep in mind, MPB basically in a dead ball era right now. So uh, the batting numbers are going to be deflated and the pitching numbers uh, are going to be inflated in the sense that, you know, like a three ERA in MLB would be fantastic. But in MPB, it's, you know, barely above average. So... Uh, Chusei Manami, 23 years old, a uh, huge breakout season for him, 25 home runs was good for fourth in the Pacific League, just one behind uh, the leaders, and he slashed 265, 321, 467 for a 788 OPS. But the main thing for me is the fact that he was able to walk 41 times, which may not seem like a lot, but this is a guy who... Uh, just last season, I think his first 100 plate appearances of the year, he didn't walk a single time. Uh, and he was just swinging out of his shoes at everything. Even opening night uh, here in 2023, Masahiro Tanaka kind of really exposed him when uh, he was up in a kind of an important spot. And Tanaka just threw three balls way out of the zone and, and Manami waved at everything. But then he kind of developed this thing throughout the year where he would stare into the camera right before every pitch, kind of regain his focus, and became a much more disciplined, well-rounded hitter. Obviously, yes, he still chases a lot. Uh, he still has a big hole in his swing, but that's just the nature of, of who he is. Uh, and if he's playing fantastic defense in, in the outfield uh, with, with that cannon of an arm, honestly, Manami might have the, the best arm for a Japanese player since Ichiro. That's how good it is. Um, and he can hit 25 to 30 bombs a year, then Manami is quickly going to be establishing himself as a, as a top 10, top 15 uh, player in, in all of MPB. So great breakout season for him. Fellow 23-year-old Yuki Nomura, 
Um, he had stretches this season where, where he was very good, ends up finishing with a 692 OPS, which again in, in the dead ball era is not very bad. He had 13 home runs, he can play a multitude of positions. Um, you know, I, I think they want him to be the cleanup hitter of the future. So hopefully he's able to take that next step again uh, in 2024. And then Kotaro Kiyomiya kind of rounds out the, the young core for me. Uh, and he missed the first couple months of the season, so he didn't get to that uh, original goal he had of 40 home runs, unfortunately. But he did hit 10, and he slashed 244, 344, 390. Uh, that's a 734 OPS right around where he was last year. And, you know, the power isn't really showing up a as, we'd, a as we'd hoped. Um, slugging under 400 definitely isn't good. But, you know, the on-base percentage is 100 points above his average. And if you take a look at the strikeout-to-walk ratio, you know, 69 Ks to 53 walks, that's, that's very good. He was putting together a lot of quality at-bats. Uh, and because of that, you know, I think... All he needs to do is, is just tap into that power a little bit more. You can sacrifice a little bit of contact, strike out more, and if he can become a 25 home run guy that also gets on base at a really high clip, then Kiyomi is going to be a really uh, potent hitter in this lineup. Ariel Martinez is also very young, uh, only 27 years old, coming over from the Chunichi Dragons via free agency. Um, he, he did very well with Chunichi, um, but he just didn't get much playing time on the top team because he's a catcher and he was kind of blocked by Takia Kinoshita there. Plus, you know, non-Japanese catchers are, are not particularly popular in MPB because of the communication barrier. But Martinez played behind the dish a couple times this season and I think he held his own very well. Um, you know, I don't know about the communication factor, but other aspects of his game, blocking, framing, I think are, are very uh polished i think he, he's a good catcher but otherwise he can play first base in dh there was a time this season when he had like an 850 ops um tailed off a little bit towards the end but still very promising season for him uh go matsumoto is the one guy that i think was was disappointing last year at age 28 he had a had a big breakout um usually was was a fourth outfielder but last year he was a a top five hitter in the league by weighted runs created plus because he just had a crazy high batting average um but you know we we kind of knew that wasn't sustainable so he hit 276 this year with a 332 on base which is okay uh but when you're only slugging 333 you need to you know have a higher average and higher on base though i will say he still plays really good defense uh in, in center field and left field Daigo Kamikawabata, another guy who took a big step in the wrong direction this year. Um, he played around, you know, half a season in 2022 and actually hit pretty well while playing superb defense at shortstop. So I thought maybe Kamikawabata could, um, you know, propel himself into like the top five shortstops in the league conversation this year, but not at all. I mean, he just could not hit. He slashed 212, 305, 236 for a 541 OPS ended up not having a home run all season long basically lost the shortstop job so Kamikawa Bata I'm still hopeful for him going forward but uh, this definitely was not it. Uh, Gosuke Kato also interesting player of course because he's a Japanese American uh, first player I believe in, in MPB history to uh, enter the league through the amateur draft for a guy that had MLB experience because he debuted with the uh, the Toronto Blue Jays last year so um, definitely an unconventional kind of path to MPB, but he has Japanese citizenship, so he can do it. And he missed the first couple of months with an injury, uh, did all right on the farm, and then he got called up in June and, and tore it up for, for a few weeks there, two or three weeks there, where he, he had like a 900 OPS. But uh, then the league kind of figured him out and he fell off. But I think Kato fits this team really well. You know, Shinjo loves kind of versatile players that he can move all around the diamond. Um, you know, he has he has a lot of players that, that like that, um, and Kato is one of them. So I think he will have a role on this team next year. And then the last guy I want to highlight is Kota Yazawa, their first round pick from uh, last season. He's a two way player, got a little bit of, you know, a little taste of both. Didn't hit very well, but at least he hit his first career home run. Um, and, he, you know, he was down on the farm most of the year. But again, at least we got a little taste of it. Uh, he also pitched 
two innings on the top level uh, and didn't give up a run. So, um, you know, with the fighters, because they have that history with, with Shohei Otani, it's definitely fun to see them trying to develop another two-way player. Uh, but moving on to the pitching side of things, they basically had three guys that held the rotation uh, all year long. That was Naoyuki Uwasawa, Takayuki Kato, and Hiromi Ito. I said before the year that, you know, if that's your front three, you should feel pretty good. Like, that's, that's a championship caliber front three. Um, and, you know, they all pitched fairly well this year. Uwasawa, a bit of a slow start, but ended up, you know, leading the league in innings with 170. So he's a real workhorse. Uh, also going to be posted to MLB this offseason. Uh, no disrespect to him. I don't really think he's going to succeed. I see him much more like a Kohei Arihara type, his former teammate. Um, you know, not really a big strikeout guy, but keeps the ball in the park effectively. And like I said, he, he grinds through games and uh, eats a lot of innings. So 2.96 ERA for him, solid year. Uh, Takayuki Kato was a guy that had, you know, a big breakout last year not that he was ever bad before that but you know last year was a really special season for him had an era uh, in the very low twos and had like the third lowest walk rate in mpb history and he replicated that this year with 0 0.9 uh walks per nine innings because this guy only tops out at around like 86 87 miles per hour but he has pinpoint command um and i'm actually really impressed that the hit prevention is is where it's at because yeah i mean he's giving up a hit per inning but the fighters defense because shinjo loves to move guys all around the diamond um and nobody really has a set position they do commit more errors than than most other mpb teams so um a pitch the contact guy like kato you would think he really isn't suited for this team but he, he does just fine and he had a 2.87 era will be a free agent this winter though so uh, let's see where he ends up going. Hiromi Ito, 25 years old, um, I think is the ace of the future for this team. He was the lone representative for the fighters on Samurai Japan. Um, ERA, definitely a bit high, 3-4-6. Um, but, you know, I think Shinjo pushed him um, a lot this year. Like, there were many instances where he was pitching just fine, but then he leaves him out there for 110 plus pitches, and that's when he starts to fall apart. Uh, not always though, you know, he did have clunkers in there, so it wasn't the best year for him, but the ratios are okay, you know, 8Ks per 9, 2.5 walks per 9, 0 0.6 home runs per 9, you know, the, the home run prevention is definitely one of the best in the business because he has so many off-speed pitches, he's a very crafty pitcher, you know, that's the word I would use for him, crafty, uh, so I think he'll be just fine, um, just a little bit of a, a shaky year for him. Kenta Uehara. Um, usually kind of a swing man, but ended up establishing himself in the rotation towards the middle of the year. Ended up with 100 innings, 2.75 ERA, so uh, definitely some promise there. Koki Kitayama, uh, young pitcher for them, first round pick a couple of years ago. Command just isn't there right now. You know, four and a half walks per nine, but I really like the stuff. So I don't know if it's going to be in the rotation or the bullpen next year, but uh, he definitely is one of their more promising young pitchers. Kenya Suzuki is a submariner. That's why those ratios look so weird. You know, 3.2 strikeouts per nine, 2.9 walks per nine. And yet he has a, a 2.63 ERA because he's just very hard to square up. Um, as a starter, he had outings this year where he would go like, you know, five innings, one hit, no strikeouts, which is, you know, in the modern game, you just don't see a pitcher like that. Um, and obviously, you know, when you're kind of, when you got kind of a gimmick like that, I don't think it's totally sustainable for a long period of time. But in, in short bursts, you know, it's definitely, he's a fun player to watch because, you know, you don't see submariners as starters really uh, in, in MLB. But in, in MPB, you got Kenya Suzuki, you got Yoza for the Lions, you know, Ray Takahashi for the Hawks. So uh, I, I like to see it. Cody Ponce missed a, a huge chunk of the year with an injury, came back towards the end, uh, 366 ERA. You know, if he's if he's like your five or six starter, you definitely feel pretty pretty good about it. Um, James Marvel came over uh, midway through the year, and I think he did he did fine as a swing man uh, as well. Take a look at their bullpen collectively. Um, they don't really have that many shutdown options. They have good pitchers for sure. I mean, you say Kawano had a 170. Uh, Takahide Ikeda led the team in games. Suguru Fukuda finished the year with a with a zero ERA across 26 innings. 
uh, and, and then Seigi Tanaka was was the guy that came over in the active player draft, which is basically like the Rule 5 draft. Um, th this past offseason from the Hawks was kind of a bust over there, but established himself as the closer for this team because uh, Naoya Ishikawa got injured. He was supposed to be the closer. And Seigi Tanaka, 3.5 ERA, but 25 saves, uh, good strikeout rate. So definitely showed a lot of promise. Um, and, and I think I, I don't want him to be the closer long term, but if he's like your seventh or eighth inning guy, then then that's very good. Uh, and shout out to Naoki Miyanishi still getting it done at 38 years old, kind of a lefty specialist. Um, and then finally, to finish off here for the for the fighters, I've made this chart that um, plots these teams based on WRC plus and FIP minus. So sort of the advanced numbers and where are the fighters? They are right here um, in the bad pitching and bad hitting category, but ever so slightly, you know, they're pretty close to league average. So if you just look at that, you would think they're pretty close to a 500 team, um, not a team that's like, you know, over 20 games below 500. So uh, they definitely underperformed in, in that regard. But again, they're a very young group. A lot of promise there, so we'll see how they bounce back in 2024. Uh, let's go on to the Cebu Lions in fifth place, 65, 77, and one. They had a negative 30 run differential, um, and the Lions actually. First thing I want to see here is they they were quite the opposite team uh, to to the Fighters in terms of how they spread their their runs. So early in the game, they're outscored pretty much every inning. I mean, look at the third inning. They got outscored 72 to 34 this year. But in the late innings, they played fairly well, which is interesting because um, their bullpen isn't, isn't particularly good. Um, so it just shows you they're a pretty feisty group. Kazuma Tsui, first year manager, I think doing a, a really good job there. Uh, they had a losing record against uh, everyone except the Eagles and and of course the the aforementioned fighters which is huge because it allowed them to get out of last place take a look at their record by month started out fairly strong 13 and 11 but then May and June was was really bad that's when they fell into the cellar uh, but played basically 500 the rest of the way and that's how they were able to um, finish finish fairly strong now let's look at their stats so with the Lions, the main concern for them from the very beginning for me was where is the offense going to be coming from? Because they had Hotaka Yamakawa, who hit 41 home runs last year, won the home run title. You knew you could rely on him, or so you thought, because he had a major scandal and falling out. So he ended up not hitting a single home run for this team all year. Um, and man, when, when that happened, I thought the Lions were pretty much screwed because there's very few players here you can rely on offensively. Uh, and yet, you know, again, they weren't great offensively, but they were able to to find a way to win games. And that a big part of that is David McKinnon coming over, first year foreigner, uh, and he filled in at first base very well. Uh, played really good defense there, hit 15 home runs with a 728 OPS. Of course, you know, on paper, you know, that, that might not seem very good. But again, in the dead ball era, that is good for... Uh, about a, a 115, 120 WRC plus, something like that. So, a uh, really good job by McKinnon. Shuta Tonosaki also having a bit of a resurgence. Uh, last couple of years, he was not good offensively at all. But you look back at those, you know, late 2010s glory days for the Lions when they had that stacked lineup. Um, Tonosaki was was one of the the main components of that. Uh, he was in left field originally, then moved over to second base once he did to Asamura signed with the Eagles. Uh, and his defense at the Keystone is, is just phenomenal. So anything he gives you offensively is a bonus. And 12 home runs, 26 steals, very good. Sosuke Genda on the other side of the second base bag, you know, obviously one of the, the faces of this franchise, uh, dealt with a broken finger to begin the year that he sustained during the WBC, played through it. Uh, for Samurai Japan, but obviously had to take some time off for the Lions, and I don't think he really ever fully recovered from that because he, you know, only slugged 300 this year, no home runs, uh, running game wasn't activated either, so not a good year for him at the plate, though, you know, he's never a guy that you're gonna expect much from offensively, he's always gonna be below league average, but this was especially bad for him, um, although, you know, great defense still at shortstop, so um, not too concerned. He's given you something. Uh, Takeya Nakamura at 40 years old 
was probably the best overall hitter for this team. Uh, had an 819 OPS, slugged almost 500 with 17 bombs. I'm um, curious, to, curious to see if he can get to the 500 mark for his career. He's at around like 471, 472 now, I believe. Um, and, and this was a, a great season for him because even though, you know, he dealt with injuries and he kind of hogs up the DH spot, last year was just so terrible that I thought he was just kind of, you know, he was just going to fade um, as his career winds down here. But maybe he can have a bit of a Albert Pujols type finish and get to uh, 500. That'd be really cool. Uh, Ryusei Sato, I must say, is a is a very uh, underrated player in this league. Uh, I've been guilty of, of overlooking him in the past, but look at that strikeout to walk ratio. He had 42 walks to 41 strikeouts, a 390 on base percentage. Um, the slugging not really there, but in the farm he has shown slash, uh, flashes of pop. So definitely a guy that uh, I have high hopes for next year. The process at the plate is very good. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, though, Aito is a guy that does not have good process at the plate. Three walks all year across 267 plate appearances. That is uh, pretty ridiculous. Um, just again, he's swinging out of his shoes at everything pretty much. Does have some sneaky pop, but when you're only hitting four home runs, you definitely cannot afford to have a 228 on um, base percentage. Great defense in, in, outf in the outfield, but uh, definitely a guy that I'm much lower on than I was in the past. Uh, Kento Watanabe, another young slugger, um, top one of their top prospects, got called up um, right around when the when the Yamakawa saga hit. Uh, had a much better you know slash line around midway through the year, uh, tailed off at the end, but still uh, six home runs here in his first kind of real taste of of MPV action. So um, a lot of people you know, just look at him and, and draw parallels to Nakamura and, and Yamakawa because he's has that same kind of physique, you know, stocky, chubby, whatever you want to call it. So uh, a guy to look forward to uh, in 2024 and beyond. And then the last guy I'll highlight here is uh, Takuya Hiruma, top draft pick from 2022. Um, his numbers on the top team may not look very good, 573 OPS, but he was really good down on the farm. Um, and I don't think he was really overmatched, you know, you know uh, at, even at the MPB level when I watched his at-bats. Um, he was drawing his walks, didn't strike out very much, uh, played very good defense in the outfield. So Hiruma definitely a guy who, once he establishes himself as an everyday player, I think his numbers are going to be very solid. And he, and he might be one of the best players on this team um by by midway next year i i think he can really be a dynamic guy top of the order or middle of the order uh depending on you know if he becomes more of a average on base guy or if he becomes more of a slugger because i think he has both parts uh in him going over to the pitching uh kona takahashi kaima taira tatsuya imai and uh, chihiro sumida all held a rotation spot for for most of the year i mean even wataru matsumoto you can add to that um, and, and Kona, Tyra, and Imai is, is a really good big three that they have there. Um, Kona is a guy that wanted to go to Major League Baseball this winter, but his team has uh, denied that request. He finished with a 2-2-1 ERA, which is basically exactly what it was last year. Uh, went to driveline over the offseason, increased his average below from like 91-92 at best to more like 94-95. So definitely looked like a whole new pitcher at times this year, but there was some inconsistency, you know, because th there were stretches where he looked like a true ace, where he would give you eight shutout innings with double-digit Ks. There were also starts where he would get knocked out before the fifth inning um, and, and only have like one or two punch outs. So uh, maybe one more year with, with the Lions here will allow him to, to fully tap into his potential, and then maybe he will get the green light to go to... MLB, but still, you know, very good year for him. Tyra, though, I think is the true ace of this team because he was a reliever for for all these years um, before, and he was just one of the most electric relievers in MPB. Decided to skip the World Baseball Classic this March so he can focus on converting to a starting pitcher, which he had to fight tooth and nail uh, to get the chance to do because, you know, the Lions, I guess they were wanting to manipulate his salary and you don't have to pay a reliever as much as a starter so they didn't want him to join the rotation but he did uh he threw 150 innings more than a strikeout per inning 
and had a 2.40 ERA. And he just looks dominant out there, you know? I think he had like his first 15 starts of his career um, going at least five innings with two earned runs or fewer. So very rarely did he have a blow up start. Uh, did struggle a little bit towards the end, but again, he was just at 23 years old, pumping mid to high 90s. He just he just looks the part. Um, my followers and I like to call him King Kaima because he is a short king, and we all support our short kings. Tatsuya Imai, another young pitcher that's always um, had a lot of promise, but the command is never there, and it wasn't there this year either. I mean, he walked over four per nine, and yet. He is basically the definition of effectively wild because you see here the hits per nine uh, down at 5.9 is very good, basically makes up for that high walk rate. And he finishes with a 2.30 ERA. Uh, he had a really bad start in late May uh, and then he kind of got deactivated for a little bit, had to refresh. But in the second half of the year, he was fantastic. One of the top 10 pitchers in, in MPB just going you know, seven innings every time with, with no runs, one run, whatever. Uh, the walks are always high, obviously. He's walking four or five guys a game, but when you don't give up many home runs or hits uh, and you get and you get your strikeouts in the right spots, then, then it works. So um, even though Kona and even Tyra to an extent are uh, ticking time bombs in the sense that eventually they're probably going to go to MLB, this is a great young rotation they have. You add to that Shihiro Sumida, their top draft pick from, from two years ago, who, you know, I know the numbers don't really jump out at you, but the ratios are really good. And for me, the eye test really checks out with Sumida. He's he's really good, um, has some great secondaries there, and he's obviously a southpaw, uh, which they don't have much of. Uh, Matsumoto, I'm not as impressed with him, but he's, again, another young pitcher. So just these five guys in the rotation right there, they're all 26 and under. Uh, take a look at the bullpen collectively. Uh, I think ERA-wise, run prevention-wise, they were fine. You had guys like Katsunori Hirai, like Shinsuke Sato, who was, you know, a along with Sumida, one of the, the top draft picks of that class uh in, in 2021 uh i think they want him to make it as a starter down down the line but for now he's just uh, you know a lefty in the bullpen doing pretty good um jesus tenoko ryosuke moriwaki bo takahashi keisuke honda uh ichiro tamura they have good options there um but they don't really have a, a flamethrower they don't have a kind of explosive reliever you can always rely on and uh it really showed in the ninth inning because tatsushi masuda their their, their veteran closer uh 19 saves but a 5.5 era over 10 hits per nine he was blowing a lot of games um and so there was a lot of uncertainty in, in that closer job ended up going to brooks Krisky towards the end of the year he uh was acquired in in like july uh a guy that has experience in mpb before with the bay stars but uh, he was in the minors this year, and, and, they, and they found him uh, to, to take over the closer spot. I think if he comes back next year, then, then he's fine. Uh, Yoshinobu Mizukami won Rookie of the Year last year, dealt with injuries this year. Um, the walk rate was, was really bad, so he, I think he struggled, but um, maybe he's a guy that can take that next step and become the closer. Minato Aoyama, a rookie, though, was actually the guy that got the first save opportunity of the season uh, on opening night. Ended up blowing it, but... He got better as the year went on, uh, definitely has promise. It's just, you know, the Lions, they have they have names there, but much like the much like the fighters, um, not many shutdown options, not many guys that you can totally 100% uh, rely on. So uh, we look here at the chart again, and yeah, they're right down in the bottom, close to the Swallows. So they weren't quite the worst team, according to, you know, the, the advanced metrics, but they were pretty close. Um, but again, they didn't finish in last place, so uh, good job. Next, the Rakuten Eagles at 70, 71, and 2. Uh, uh, um, obviously, just barely missed the playoffs. If they won yesterday, they would have snuck in, in in third place. Negative 43 run differential was worst in the Pacific League, though. Uh, so let's go over to the Eagles. And we see that they played fairly competitively against every team. I mean, that's what you expect out of a 500 team. Um, they did do really well against the Hawks, so um, I was curious, you know, if the Eagles snuck into the playoffs, then they match up well with the Hawks. What if they beat the Hawks, and then they would go up against Oryx, who, you know, they're not very good up good against, but 
I think the Eagles uh, are the only team this year that beat all five of, of the Buffalo's kind of main starters in Yamamoto, Miyagi, Yamashita, Tajima, uh, and Yamasaki. So it would have been it would have been fun to see, but um, they finished in fourth place for the second straight year. Uh, go over to their monthly records. We see that for the first three months of the year, they were way under 500. Uh, just a terrible start to the year, but then they really turned it on late. Um, July 15 and 7, August 12 and 12, September 13 and 9, and then October they needed to do better than 2 and 3. Um, if they if they were just 3 and 2 or you know 4 and 1, they would have they would have made the playoffs. But still, I think it was a valiant effort by them to to come back um, after after such a disastrous start to the year. You know their their manager Kazuhisa Is Ishii. I don't have much faith in him, but uh, he didn't lose the clubhouse and he was able to have, have have his group fight all the way, which is kind of the opposite of what they did last year because last year they started out really strong and then and then tanked. Um, but this is a team that really knows how to hit. Hideto Asamura is is the superstar. Um, his time at second base is is running out uh, as, as it gets older. He's going to be more of a, a first base DH guy, but he still played a decent amount of second base this year. Uh, ended up sharing the home run title with two other players, 26 home runs, slashed 276, 370, 465 for an 836 OPS. I actually don't think this is updated from yesterday's game, but that's fine. He's a total Iron Man, basically never misses a game. Hiroto Kobukata is a good uh, table setter at the top of the lineup, 36 stolen bases, led the Pacific League, um, 330 on base percentage, you know, not, not going to slug much, of course, but he can move all around the diamond. Uh, can, he can play shortstop, outfield, so he's a nice role player to have. Rosuke Tatsumi, though, I do think is one of the more underrated players in, in all of MPB. This is a guy that can hit double-digit home runs, steal double-digit uh, double bases, play fantastic defense in center field, and he, he's a well-above-average hitter. Uh, slashed 262, 341, 381, 721 OPS, and that's including a really slow start to the year. If you just look at his numbers... Um, from, from July, I'm sure he would have an OPS near 800, uh, and he's still very young. So I think Tatsumi is one of the, the better young players in, in this game, and a guy who I think if everything clicks, could be like a 2020 candidate. Uh, not sure if, if, if he will ever get there, but it's definitely a possibility. Uh, Yuya Ogo finally got quite a bit of playing time this year. He was usually more of just kind of a, a bench guy. Uh, 10 home runs, 13 steals, so much like Tatsumi, getting it done on, on both, uh, you know, base running and, and at the plate. Uh, very similar slash line to, to, to Tatsumi, actually, so uh, he, he established himself as a good contributor. Takeru Okajima is always interesting because he seems to alternate between, like, good years and bad years. So 2021 was a good year, 2022 was a bad year for him, and this year was, was a solid year for him. He was... Uh, definitely important for them um, to kind of bring stability into the lineup as a left-handed bat when Hiroaki Shimauchi was struggling so much because he was really one of the most disappointing players in, in all of MPB uh, this year, in, in my opinion at least, because Shimauchi was a guy that posted a 150 WRC plus in both 2021 and 2022, you know, with an OPS well over 800. So I was expecting big things from him, but Man, he just had a really terrible start to the year. Uh, did get better towards the end when he kind of reintegrated himself into the lineup. Like yesterday, he was hitting third. So obviously towards the end of the year, the trust in him was regained. But overall, uh, a 234 average, a 661 OPS, that just isn't going to cut it. Um, you need him to be more of a, a potent middle of the order force. You know, He was hitting cleanup for them last year. So uh, definitely disappointing. Itsuki Murabayashi, 25 years old, uh, had a big breakout. OPS, not all that impressive, but uh, 11 stolen bases, 14 doubles, and uh, crucially, he plays some superb defense at shortstop. So uh, Murabayashi ended up being, you know, a guy that would hit like like second in the lineup a lot towards the end of the year. Um, and and I think he is, you know, I don't want to speak prematurely, much like I did with Kami Kawabata last year, but. Uh, he has a potential to be a, a, a top five shortstop in the game because, you know, if the offense gets a little bit better, then right there you have, if you have a league average hitter that plays, you know, gold glove defense, then then that's awesome. Um, 
I, I will point out that Toshiki Abe, much like um, Shimauchi, when, when the year began, he, he was putting up some god-awful numbers. I mean, they traded for him this offseason uh, from the Dragons for Hide Akiwakui, which I thought was a bit of a weird trade for both teams because the Dragons are, you know, they're short on offense. The Eagles are a bit short on pitching depth. Um, but they got rid of their veteran starter to to go for Abe. They targeted him. He's a local kid. Um, not he's not a kid. He's a, he's an old man. But um, ended up with a 7.43 OPS this year. And again, because he was so uh, bad to start the year, I think if you just look at his second half numbers, he would have like probably probably like an 8.50 OPS. That's how good he was towards the end. Uh, and he is a utility man, so definitely um, lengthened this lineup. Uh, and something else I really like about this team is, is their catching tandem. Uh, Hikaru Ota and Ginjiro Sumitani uh, is, is what it was most for most of this year, but Yuma Yasuda is going to be the guy that takes over for Sumitani in the near future. They call him the Blue Godzilla. Uh, only a 641 OPS this year, but he has some serious pop. I, I see him as a guy that can hit 15 to 20 bombs like Takumi Oshiro in the near future. So uh, along with Ota, who is, you know, he had a 700 OPS, uh, playing, you know, competent defense behind the plate. He's only 26 years old. Uh, I think that's a that's a really good, um, you know, pair of catchers they have back there. Uh, Igoro Mogi, really, you know, disappointing couple of years it's been for him. Um, 29 years old. At, at one point, he was one of the better players in the league. Um, always posting like a 750 to 800 OPS with, you know, gold glove defense at third base, but. Uh, he's dealt with some injuries the last couple of years and also just when he gets playing time he's not he's not doing anything so um, hopefully he's able to rebound uh, next year let's take a look at the pitching uh, which is you know a weakness for them Takahiro Norimoto got the start last night actually and lost um, but overall I think Norimoto is close enough to, to an ace. I wouldn't call him a true ace anymore. He's way past his prime when he, when he was winning five straight strikeout titles. Uh, you see the K rate has dipped significantly, but still, you know, posting a 2.60 ERA, uh, he was getting the job done, you know, giving, the, giving them a chance to win every time out. But the same cannot be said for Masahiro Tanaka, who was supposed to be a game changer for this team when he came back to Tohoku two years ago. Uh, you know, 2021 and 2022 were not bad years for him by any means. He had an ERA in the low to mid threes, which obviously is not where he was a decade ago at his best, but still that's that's a quality pitcher, a quality veteran presence to have. But uh, he was the worst pitcher in MPB this year among qualifiers, uh, which, you know, 10.1 hits per nine. The, the strikeout rate took a nosedive, only 5.2. Uh, and he just had so many starts this year where he wouldn't even be able to give his chance the team to win you know he would go three innings seven runs or he would go four innings eight runs you know i think if you really looked at how many blow up starts he had he might lead the league in that category because uh masahiro tanaka just is not the guy uh, i thought he was in terms of i thought he would maybe be able to pitch until he's like 40 because he's so cerebral uh, has such good off-speed weapons. I thought he'd be able to kind of just be, be an average pitcher at the very least for the rest of his career, but it seems he might be washed, which I, I really hate to say for for a legend like him. Uh, Takayuki Kishi, though, at 38 years old, had a very solid year, 307 ERA. Um, started out slow, but definitely finished strong. Kosei Shoji, the rookie, um, he had a solid year i think i mean he doesn't really work that deep into games yet but definitely shows flashes of plus stuff uh takahisa hayakawa i don't think has really reached his full potential yet um you know one of the top pro prospects of the 2020 draft class and when the eagles got him it seemed really really promising because you know norimoto tanaka kishi um these are much older guys so they needed some youth in the rotation and uh hayakawa seemed like he could be a shot in the arm but hasn't really worked out for him yet uh always having an era in in the mid to high threes but again with him much like sumida for the lions he shows flashes of being dominant and because of that i'm not going to lose hope in him take a look at the bullpen um collectively it wasn't bad but 
They did have a lot of trouble at times getting to Yuki Matsui in the ninth, who is, you know, the probably the best closer um, in the Pacific League, if not all of MPB. There's Rydal Martinez for the Dragons, but I would say Matsui is second. Uh, 11.3 Ks per nine, despite not having a big fastball, um, because he has such good rise on that thing. And, you know, forkball slider are dominant pitches. He's a guy that's actually interested in going to MLB as well, although it would be via free agency and not via the posting system. Um, but yeah, getting to Matsui in the ninth inning uh, was a challenge at times. They had um, Tomohi Tomohito Sakai uh, was really good in the first half, but then he kind of fell off. Uh, Sora Suzuki was was decent all year long, but not you know fair, not that reliable just because of the walks. Uh, Tomohiro Unraku, Seidu Uchi, um, Chao Hao Sung, Shota Watanabe, uh, a rookie along with Uchi. Those guys definitely. Um, showed a lot of promise, but again, much like the, the two teams prior, they don't have that many shutdown guys in the bullpen who you can hand the ball to and say, yes, this guy's going to get me my three outs and we're going to win this game. So uh, definitely something for the Eagles to uh, work on going forward. And we take a look at the chart. Uh, and we see they are way over to the right side here in the good hitting, bad pitching category. So uh, according to the advanced metrics, they were the best offense in the league. Had a WRC plus as a team of around 111, uh, which is really solid. Uh, pitching, though, was was well below average. All right. Next up is the SoftBank Hawks. We thought they might finish in second place, but uh, the Marines psyched us out. So they ended up in third, 71-69 in three with a plus 29 run differential, which was uh, the second best in the Pacific League. So let's go over to the Hawks uh, and we see with their head to head records, again, they were basically like the Eagles, pretty much 500 against everyone, uh, except the fighters who they were significantly better against. But that just isn't going to cut it for a team that a lot of people, myself included, thought could compete for one of the best teams at MPB history. And that's not an exaggeration. Started out fairly strong, you know, winning record in each of the first three months, uh, capped off by a 15 and 8 June. Um, but then they went 7 and 15 in, in July, including, you know, like a 12 game losing streak right around when the fighters had that losing streak. Uh, and that knocked them out of the pennant race for good. August wasn't good for them either. And then they finished right around, you know, 500. So uh, the Hawks definitely did not play you know, inspiring baseball, in my opinion, for a team that on paper looked so good. Uh, you can go back and watch my preseason uh, preview for this team if you want to know why I thought they'd be so good. But essentially, it boils down to you have Yuki Yanagita and Kensuke Kondo, who are, you know, two Hall of Famers, surefire Hall of Famers at this point in their careers. Uh, you have Roya Kurihara, who was coming off an ACL tear, yes, but a really promising young player. And then they just have so much depth. It's not really about the stars at that point, uh, but they have so much depth with guys like Taisei Makihara, with Masaki Mimori, with Tata, uh, Tatsuru Yanagimachi, Ukyo Shuto, uh, Akira Nakamura, Kenta Imamiya. Um, you know, even a, even a younger guy like Richard Tsunagawa. Like, uh, it was like, you know, they're going to beat you with pure depth. But what ended up happening is it was basically only Yanagita and Kondo uh, contributing to this team offensively. Everyone else was just very much uh, mediocre. For the Hawks, they just did not mesh very well. You know, you have Yanagita who posted an 861 OPS, um, was was a really good bounce back year for him actually in terms of he played the, the whole 143, which he hadn't done in a while. Um, the strikeout rate dipped significantly. Um, he, he was, you know, not bad at all last year, but he seemed like he was kind of on the decline. But this year, he proved that once again, he is one of the best players in the league still, even at age 34. Uh, but Kensuke Kondo was was the main story for this team. Coming over from the fighters in free agency, he slashed 303, 431, 529 for a 959 OPS. Uh, he was the best hitter in all of MPB by WRC+. Plus. And crucially, he hit 26 home runs, which coming into coming into the year was not part of his game at all. Kondo's a guy who usually 
uh, with the fighters would have a very upper body centric swing in that he would just kind of swing with, with not much leg movement involved. He would slash a lot of balls down the line, get a lot of doubles out of it. Uh, but ultimately, he's a guy that would just take his walks. A very disciplined, well-rounded hitter. He's going to slash 300, 400, 400 usually, right? So this year, he took that next step and he became that perfect 300, 400, 500 hitter. Um, really activated his full body, I think, in his swing. And, and he was able to, you know, share the home run title. Uh, with with Asamura and uh, Polanco, which, you know, I didn't see coming necessarily. You know, I thought Kondo could definitely hit for more power. He was my MVP prediction before the year. Uh, but I think a big part of this was playing on Samurai Japan and hitting second in the lineup, sandwiched between uh, Lars Nupar and Shohei Otani. I mean, that might have, that, that must have helped his confidence because he did so well. Uh, for Samurai Japan, and he thought, hey, I can I can hang with some of these MLB superstars, so, you know, I'm going to go out there and, and, and try to hit uh, way more bombs, and he did just that. Akira Nakamura, um, you know, he's, he's a veteran. He always does the same thing every year. He just walks a lot, doesn't strike out, 60 walks to 53 strikeouts. He's a really good hitter, um, very good pure hitter, doesn't have power, but 351 on base, very valuable. Kenta Imamiya, um, had a great year last year. I think he was the best uh, qualified shortstop in the league offensively. This year, not uh, not all that good, but still like very much passable. You know, a 670 OPS uh, at shortstop is pretty good by MPB standards. Uh, Taki Akai actually had a bounce back year, um, which is funny to say for a guy with a 602 OPS, but he hit 10 home runs. Last year, he hit one. Uh, and with Kai, he's a terrible framer but he can block and he can stop the running game very effectively has probably the best arm behind the plate in all of japan so um for for a guy that's you know that important to the team from a from a defensive standpoint if if he can give you 10 home runs that's a big bonus now roya kurihara a couple of years ago seemed like he might surpass yuki yanagita on this team because you know he was a guy that could hit 20 bombs and you know have have an ops uh, in, in the 850 range. So logically, if he took that next evolution in his game, maybe he could have become a superstar. But last year, tore his ACL in, in the first week of the season. And uh, it's obviously a very difficult injury to come back from. But next year is what I'm really banking on for Kurihara because he wasn't bad this year. 13 home runs, 690 OPS. That's that's not bad um, by you know dead ball standards. But I know he's capable of a lot more. Uh, also, the defensive metrics love him at third base, but the eye test doesn't really check out. He's not; he doesn't seem very uh, comfortable there at third base. I think he's still much more of a natural outfielder, but still, um, I, I think they should let him stay at third base. The Hawks must have him positioned very well if he has such good defensive metrics. But you know, I'm hoping for from that year two bounce back, like Ronald Acuna um, from his ACL tear. Although, obviously. He's not a player of, of Acuna's caliber, but, you know, I think he can be an 800 OPS guy again next year. Um, Taisi Magiara was on Samurai Japan. Uh, he just is, a, he's a free swinger, you know, never really taking pitches. Uh, and when you do that, you need to hit better than 259. So I think a disappointing season for him. Uh, Tatsuru Yanagimachi um, was, you know, like like a top five in the, in the rookie of the year type guy last year. Um, and ended up doing very good this year too. 375 on base. He's definitely a nice little player. Uh, and Ukyo Shuto with 36 stolen bases uh, ended up tied with uh, Kobukata of, of the Hawks uh, or of the of the Eagles rather. Um, offense early in the year was, was really bad. Towards the end, it started coming along a lot more, but uh, obviously not much power there. Slugging below 300, which is disappointing for me because uh, last season, he uh, showed a little more uh, in the tank there. Uh, but also, the main story for this team was the fact that they got literally zero production from their foreigners. Uh, Williams Astadio, Alfredo Despine, Freddie Galvis. I mean, good lord, if you combine those three players uh, and looked at their overall numbers, they would not be pretty. They hit, you know, one home run between the three of them. Astadio got one, uh, I think in, in Chiba it was, but obviously none of them really... Had, had any success offensively. Uh, oh, and they did have um, uh, Courtney Hawkins as well, who 
went 0 for 9, unfortunately. So they're going to need to do a lot better job uh, scouting foreigners because that was a huge strength of this team in their dynasty years when they had guys like uh, Deho Lee and they had, you know, Williams uh, and, and they had Alfredo Despine in his prime and they had Uris Bulgraciol. These guys you could rely on for, for 20 home runs at least, maybe even 30. Uh, but now, you know, what a, what a flipping that on its head. They got one home run from their entire foreign group. Take a look at the pitching. Uh, and again, before the season, I recognized they didn't really have a true ace, but I thought they could beat you with, with depth, with sheer depth, and they didn't do that. Uh, Shuta Ishikawa, veteran on this team, led the team in innings with only 125. Uh, Kohei Arihara, coming back from you know a failed MLB stint, uh, had a very good year, 2-3-1 ERA. Uh, peripherals are not all that good, but still, he was kind of the de facto ace of this team towards the end of the year. Uh, Tomohisa Ozeki, what is, he's dealt with injuries, had, had cancer last year, actually. Uh, but when, when he's on, he is really good. Uh, actually had the number one pitching performance of the year, according to game score. So, you know, when, when he's on, he's really good. Tsuyoshi Wada at 42 years old. Uh, still pitched 100 innings and did fairly well, so uh, that's good. But I always think, you know, when when you have a guy that's that old and still like one of your core pitchers, that's both a success story and it's kind of a failure of of the rest of your guys to kind of step up. The rest of your younger guys. Uh, now Higashihama didn't have a great year, 4.52 ERA. Uh, this was definitely one of the worst years of his career. Uh, Yugo Bando, swingman. Did all right. You know, honestly, I, I think he's pretty well suited for, for the rotation. He's not a guy that's going to go very deep, but for five innings every time out, I think he's fine. Uh, Carter Stewart is is the most exciting pitcher, I think, of this entire staff. Uh, not just based on the fact that, you know, he, he pumps 90, 96, 97 regularly, uh, but because he's one of the few guys, I think, that has tr true ace potential. Um, and this was his first real taste of MPB action after... Obviously, a pretty unprecedented case uh, after he was drafted, you know, top 10 to the, to the Atlanta Braves uh, in 2018, going unsigned and coming to Japan. That is a that, that was a Scott Boris move. Um, and, you know, last uh, next year is going to be the final year of his contract. So we'll see if it ends up working out for him. Uh, but he had a 3 3 80 RA this year. Pretty good strikeout rate, but the walks are just way too high. Uh, so he definitely still has those command problems and a lot of kinks in his game to iron out. But again, he has he has flashes there where it's like, yeah, this guy's this guy's a true ace. He looks unhittable at times. Uh, overall, though, I will say a little bit disappointing. Koya Fuji, they stuck into the rotation to begin the year um, after he had just a dominant relief season uh, last year, but. He ended up getting hurt, so then they just stuck him back in the bullpen towards the end, and I think that's the role he is much more fit for, honestly, because in the bullpen, he is just absolutely electric. He's like, you know, 14 Ks per nine type guy uh, in the back end of the bullpen, whereas as a starter, he was fine, but he was never really going that deep into games anyway, so I think you're kind of, you're, you're overextending your hand by, by doing that. Take a look at their bullpen. Uh, Roberto Osuna, the closer, 092 ERA. Um, obviously, he, he's really good. Uh, 26 saves. Um, uh, Hiroshi Kaino, Ryosuke Otsu, and uh, Fumimaru Tara is kind of this this new guard of, of relievers they have. Um, these guys were not really there during, during the dynasty years. I mean, some of them were, but they weren't really big parts. Um, but now, you know, this is kind of their new guard. Uh, and they needed some of these guys to step up because Levon Moinello, who I think is, you know, a top two, top three reliever in all of Japan, uh, he got injured uh, midway through the year and, and missed the rest of the year after posting an 098 ERA with uh, 12 Ks per nine. Uh, he's just always that guy, you know, just locked down as setup man. He got a chance to be closer last year, but they picked up Osuna, so he moved back to setup. And yeah, he was having a great year, but unfortunately wasn't able to uh, finish it out. So uh, the, the Hawks bullpen, honestly, is good. Uh, it's just not, you know, completely dominant as it was during their dynasty years. And especially without Moinello in the playoffs, uh, it might become exposed. Because, I mean, Yuki Matsumoto, I think, is kind of their go-to guy at this point. 
Um, and, and he's very good. I mean, 11 and a half strikeouts per nine, a, a 268 ERA. And yet, every time I watch him, I still don't feel completely secure because the walk rate's a little bit high and he does, you know, give up the occasional home run. Uh, now we look here at the chart and we see that they are, you know, relatively close to, to the Eagles in that bad pitching, good hitting category. Um, they have about like a 105 WRC plus offensively, but they're below average uh, in terms of fielding independent pitching. And overall with the pitching, I think, you know, the 2023 Hawks prove that you can have all the depth in the world. You know, I think they have more kind of league average type players, both offensively and, and on the pitching side than any team. But when you don't have that one guy you can rely on since Kodai Senga left, uh, it becomes very difficult to, to find consistency at times. All right, moving on. The Lotte Marines managed to finish in second place with a 70, 68, and 5 record. Uh, negative 19 run differential, so obviously overperformed a tiny bit. Uh, and the Marines, you know, they were uh, very bad against the Buffaloes, but pretty good against basically everyone else. You know, they had a winning record against everyone else except the Hawks. They were 500 against. Uh, so really the first place Buffaloes were the only team they struggled against. Take a look at their monthly records, though. Uh, 14 and 10 in March and April, 12 and 6 in May, uh, 8 and 12 in June because they didn't do that well in interleague, but 13 and 7 in July. So right around the All Star break, they were only two or three games out of the pennant, and they had a legitimate shot there to catch the Buffaloes. But then 11 and 15 in in August, and then 7 and 16 in September, almost ended their season. That was when they fell out of. Uh, the, the, the playoff picture at one point, but thankfully they were able to regroup. They went five and two in October, so they avoided a, a complete choke. Uh, although I don't even know if I would call it a choke for them, even if they missed the playoffs, because I was not expecting much from this team. I predicted they would finish in fifth place, uh, and they obviously way overperformed that. Uh, take a look at the hitting side. Shogo Nakamura is kind of the face of this team. He's been there uh, longer than, than most of the players, um, kind of the captain, but you know, this year just wasn't it for him. He had a 220 average and a 629 OPS did hit 11 home runs, but, uh, he was a guy that started the year hitting like third in, in the lineup a lot. And yesterday for the last game of the season, he was hitting ninth. So that tells you, um, how, how his standing has kind of fallen and his defense at second base also just is not what it used to be, uh, back in his prime. Uh, of course, he used to steal a lot of bases, too. So really, every part of his game has has been uh, dulled by, by quite a big margin. Um, you know, I think he still is an important veteran presence there, but ultimately a really disappointing year for him. Gregory Polanco, on the other hand, ends up sharing the home run title with, with the aforementioned Asamura and Kondo with 26 bombs. Uh, had a pretty slow start to the year. Didn't, you know, he only had like one home run uh, into May, but... Polanco this season had two three home run games, two hat tricks, and nobody else in the league even had one. So there you go. He had two games, basically he had six home runs in, in, in just two games. Uh, and that's going to really help your case when the home run leader only has 26 home runs, which isn't a lot. Uh, but Polanco has basically posted the exact same slash line now for two straight seasons. Last year with the Omiri Giants, uh, had an OPS right around 770, and that's exactly what he did this year. So we know what he's capable of and you know with the Giants he had to play outfield so he was kind of exposed but with the Marines being able to to DH all the time and just kind of you know quietly sit in the cleanup spot um, he, he's a very valuable presence and obviously a big time power threat especially when he's hot because he becomes pretty unstoppable uh, Koki Yamaguchi is is the other kind of big power threat on this team um, doesn't really, you know, strikes out a lot, but when he runs into the ball, he hits it a really long ways. Hisanori Yasuda hit a home run last night, so he finishes with nine. Uh, but overall, a, a very disappointing year for him, I think, because, you know, right around uh, the end of May, he had an OPS of, of 800. Uh, so he, he really fell off towards the end. And even though Yasuda is still 24 years old, uh, and, and I think he has the opportunity to kind of, 
you know, step up and, and maybe hit 20 home runs eventually. I'm beginning to think this is just who Yasuda is offensively. You know, he struggles against even, even the fastball, which uh, is not a good sign for, for a young hitter. Um, and he walks a lot, so, so the on-base is always going to be, you know, fairly decent. But, um, you know, he's not really tapping into the power consistent, consistently enough. Uh, at the very least, though, he plays great defense at the hot corner, so he, he does bring a lot of, lot of value in that regard. Uh, Yudai Fujioka, big kind of breakout out of nowhere for him. He, he has a 395 on base percentage um, and, a, and a 752 OPS. This is a guy who was, this is a guy that was basically just kind of a, you know, a utility third baseman shortstop for the, for the majority of his career. Uh, never really an OPS higher than, than 650. Uh, and, and this year he just shows up and posts almost a 400 on base thanks to that uh, great walk rate. So uh, a great process at the plate. Uh, only played in 92 games and actually did commit some costly errors at shortstop uh, there in August that, that lost them a few games. But ultimately, you know, he was a very important uh, piece for, for this team. Hiromi Oka, a veteran, uh, he's been around the block. Uh, 785 OPS. He can play, you know, all three outfield spots. Uh, stole 14 bases. So even though he is a little bit on the older end of the spectrum, um, you know, he can still run. He can still hit homers. 370 on base. Very underrated player, I think. Oka Oka is very good. Uh, and he was platooning quite a bit with uh, Kyoto Fujiwara, who is not as good. Uh, had a good start to the year, yes, but ends up finishing with a sub 300 on base and. Uh, barely kept his OPS above 600, as well as the fact that he doesn't play great defense in, in center field. Uh, so he's 23, and the thing with Fujiwara is, for so many years, the, his teammates have said that he's the next big thing on this team, he's going to be the next breakout player, but we haven't seen it yet. So um, I, I like Fujiwara, you know, he was a, he was a star in, in high school, so I, I'm waiting for that big breakout, but uh, definitely hasn't happened yet. Uh, Katsuya Kakunaka, uh, 36 years old, still getting it done, was probably, you know, pound for pound the best hitter on this team this year. 861 OPS, slugging over 500, uh, hitting almost 300. So he has pretty extreme splits. You know, he's a, you know, he kills righties, but I don't think he has a single home run in his career against, against lefties, uh, literally. So um, he, he's not a guy that can you can reliably expect to, to hit every single game but when you're going up against a righty which there's more righties than lefties in the league he's he's a great player to have in the middle of your lineup uh shingo ishikawa speaking of you know kind of heavy platoon guys uh he came over from the yomiuri giants around the trade deadline because he's really good against lefties and um never really established himself as an everyday player because doesn't really play great defense uh and he does have some pretty extreme splits but in the little playing time that he got, I mean, 348 average, 381 on base, 455 slug, 837 OPS. He was really good for the Marines, uh, and, and he should be a very important kind of uh, bench piece uh, in the postseason here. Uh, Koshiro Wada, a, a young you know speed specialist, stole, stole 19 bases this year, mostly as, as a pinch runner. But he can swing the bat a little bit, too. You know, I, I, all I've heard about this guy for, for years is he's really fast, but he can hit. But hey, I mean, he posted an 800 OPS, obviously, in a small sample size, but that's better than, you know, most of the guys on this team. So I think they should give him a shot to, um, you know, be, be in the everyday lineup a little bit more. And towards the end of the year, they were. Uh, Raito Ikeda coming up from the farm um, also did very well, I think, 731 OPS as a rookie. You know, limited limited plate appearances, but still very good. Uh, Mike Brousseau, though, I would say, was, was really disappointing. He came over midway. Uh, towards the end of July was brought in to you know crush lefties because that's what he did in MLB obviously has that famous moment against Arolas Chapman in the 2020 uh, ALDS I think uh, but he just didn't hit at all I mean a 191 average and a 505 OPS only hit one home run uh, to be fair his numbers against lefties are actually quite a bit better than that but um, you know ultimately wasn't really able to contribute to the team Oh, and I should point out Takashi Ogino, father time finally seems to be catching up to him uh, because his last three or four years, he was really defying the aging curve, having some of the best seasons of his career, 
he is kind of made of glass at this point, so he doesn't play very at much. But uh, this year, yeah, he did have he did have a bit of a, a down season. That said, if he's healthy, I still think he can be really good. Uh, take a look at the pitching. Uh, Kazuya, Ojima, Ka Kazuya Ojima pitched the uh, pitched yesterday actually through seven shutout innings in in you know the Marines' most crucial game of the year. So uh, great job by him. Uh, he's the main innings eater on this team. Uh, Atsuki Taneichi, I know the ERA seems a little bit inflated, 3-4-2, but um, for, for some parts of this year, he was one of the better pitchers in all of MPB, uh, and he had the best strikeout rate, actually, uh, among pitchers with at least 130 innings. I mean, 10.3 Ks per nine, I think his K rate was pretty close to 30%. So, you know, a great job by Taneichi here. He, he was a top prospect in the past, but then he had Tommy John, so his stock fell a little bit, but I think he really regained it this year. Uh, Yuji Nishino, though, was a, a really important uh, rotation piece for this team because I don't think he's been a starter for, for quite a while. You know, he was a, a good reliever last year, but uh, usually no, nothing more than, than a spot starter these past couple of years. Uh, and, and this year, I mean, he threw 117 innings, had a 2.69 ERA, good ratios as well. So um, for a team that had a little bit of uncertainty in the rotation coming into the year, and they didn't have a Yumu Ishikawa, who's usually, you know, a pretty good constant there. Uh, Nishino stepping up was was huge. CC Mercedes, much like Polanco coming over from uh, the Giants, uh, his strikeout rate dipped pretty significantly, 4.5 uh, Ks per nine, which, you know, he was more like a 7 Ks per nine guy, guy with the Giants, but still did fairly well. Um, doesn't give up home runs and, and you know, eats innings. So uh, he was fairly good, I think. Manabu Mima. 4.76 ERA. Um, he was pretty good last year, but the year before that wasn't. So, you know, I just think he's not very consistent anymore. He's a little bit uh, washed. Uh, Roki Sasaki, you know, 91 innings, 135 strikeouts, 178 ERA, 075 whip. Need I say more? Uh, the 21 year old Phenom unfortunately tore his oblique in late july uh and then he came back in september much earlier than we thought but then uh he caught covid as as he was kind of you know trying to ease his way back in so i don't really know what kind of role he's going to play in the postseason i would expect him to at least be able to throw a couple of innings um but yeah he's not at full strength but still for half the season roki was the best pitcher in the league and i just hope and i just pray he stays healthy next year so we can actually see a full season from him because because man he was on some record setting pace uh this year before he got hurt uh and shout out to luis castillo i think he stepped up uh pretty big after roki got hurt um you know numbers aren't necessarily great but uh, the walk rate is really low, so that's kind of rare usually for a foreign import. A lot of foreign pitchers are, they have command problems, but really good stuff, and they try to kind of iron out those kinks here. But for him, you know, not many strikeouts, but uh, was definitely limiting the walks, so uh, the whip is, is fairly good. Uh, take a look at their bullpen, and it was a good bullpen. Uh, it, it wasn't as good in the second half as it was in the first half, but but uh, Takahiro Nishimura uh, got acquired from the Fighters in a trade uh, this past winter. One two five ERA. He had a he had a big kind of uh, resurgence. Uh, Koshiro Sakamoto is you know he's more of a specialist. Uh, really good splits against lefties, but overall uh, good numbers. Uh, Luis Perdomo was I think the league leader in holds, if I'm not mistaken. I thought he might pitch out of the rotation uh, when they first signed him, but ended up being uh, a really important you know seventh eighth inning guy for this team. Uh, Naoya Masuda is still the closer, ERA obviously a bit high, 378, um, but the K rate still pretty good. It's basically it's mostly just the home runs, uh, which made him really shaky at times this year. Um, he's he's definitely not the kind of shutdown option he was. Uh, in his prime, but you know, I, I, I still think you feel pretty good um, going into the ninth inning if you have Masuda. Hirokazu Sawamura, though, was was probably the most disappointing player uh, on the pitching side for them this year because coming back from, from MLB with the Red Sox, and he didn't do bad in, in Boston at all. I mean, he wasn't really you know, a, a high leverage reliever by any means, but he did fine in kind of a middle leverage role, um, had some strikeouts. So coming back to, to the Marines this year after, you know, he had a good couple of months, a really good couple of months back in 2020, which was able to propel him to get that MLB contract. 
Uh, I thought he could be kind of a shutdown setup man or maybe even win the closer job. Uh, but he just didn't get it done this year. I mean, ERA approaching five, uh, big home run problem, lots of walks, and even the strikeouts just were not there despite the fact that he has you know, plus stuff. He only got 6.5 Ks per nine. So everything about Sawamura this year was just uh, very underwhelming. Uh, Daiki Iwashita, I think, is is really promising. He can be a swing man, or maybe he can uh, win kind of a, a late inning role next year. Yusuke Azuma was good. Uh, and Rikuto Yokoyama, I know he has a 5.26 ERA, but don't let that deceive you. He was much better for, for the majority of the season. Uh, his numbers really took a hit when, when he was used as an opener a couple of weeks ago and he got blown up in the first inning. Um, but, you know, he has really good stuff. He's only 21 years old and he has this unconventional kind of sidearm sling, much like Taisei for the Yomiuri Giants. So um, I think Yokoyama, not as a starter, but, you know, as, as like a closer of their future, I think has a ton of promise. And we take a look at the chart here, and the Marines are um, in the good pitching, bad hitting category. So um, for a team that I didn't really expect much from before the year, I definitely didn't expect them to be an above average pitching staff. Um, I think they did really well. And a big part of that is the fact that guys like Nishino and Taneichi stepped up. And yes, their season kind of derailed after Roki got injured. Uh, you know, it's not totally about Roki because I think their fielding kind of also took a, a big step back for some reason right around them. So maybe it was kind of a vibes problem. But ultimately, you know, they finished in second place. So even though they were basically a 500 team, I would say this was a really good season for them. And uh, we'll see if they can get past the Hawks in, in the playoffs. And last but not least, in the Pacific, we get to the Oryx Buffaloes, who easily won the pennant by 15 and a half games with an 86, 53 and 4 record, plus 80 run differential. Um, and yeah, I mean, the Buffaloes, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't concerned a little bit about their offense coming into the year based on the fact that they lost Masataka Yoshida, their superstar uh, slugger. But it really just wasn't a big deal for them, and they beat up on basically, you know, every other team in the Pacific. And you look at their monthly records, and yeah, they had a winning record every month, uh, except except October, but uh, June through September in particular. I mean, they only lost single-digit games there every single month, so a really dominant kind of pennant performance for them. Uh, we look over here um, at their hitters. Keita Nakagawa, I think, had had a really good year um, hitting, you know, in the middle of that lineup. 12 home runs, uh, a 751 OPS. Versatile, he can play uh, all around the diamond, kind of, although he mostly plays, you know, center field. Uh, Kotaro Kuribayashi, I really enjoyed the year he had. Eight home runs, a 695 OPS. It was a little bit better at one point, but... Uh, his defense at shortstop also improved a little bit. So at 21 years old, I, I'm really hopeful for Kuribayashi. I think he will be uh, one of the better shortstops uh, in, in this league for the next decade. Yuma Mune had a really good month of September that kind of saved his season. But ultimately, I mean, still a 622 OPS, only a 309 on base uh, for a guy that, you know, last two years has been a pretty co uh, consistent table setter at the top of the lineup getting on base at around like a 340 350 clip uh and even the power i mean there was a time when mune almost hit double digits so um a, a disappointing season for him overall but defense at third base is still fantastic uh tomo yamori though i think was the x factor for this team obviously the big free asian addition that they kind of used the posting fee money from masadaka yoshida to sign and there were times this season where if you just replaced Mori's name with Yoshida in the lineup, you wouldn't even notice the difference. He finishes with a 900 OPS, did miss a little bit of time with injury. Uh, and there was concern because he's not the best defensive catcher that, you know, maybe some of these great Buffaloes pitchers like Yamamoto wouldn't like pitching to him. Um, but it ended, it ended up working out because uh, Kenya Wakatsuki um, is, is, a, is a pretty good offensive catcher in his own right, and he's... Basically, Yamamoto's personal catcher, so Mori would DH or even play outfield towards the end of the year um, when when Yamamoto was on the mound. But otherwise, you know, he could still rotate in and out of the catching position. Uh, and yeah, I mean, he's he's just a fantastic hitter. Uh, Yuma Tongu, 
was just, I mean, unbelievable this year. He won the batting title with a 307 average, uh, 378 on base, 484 slug, and 862 OPS, 16 bombs. I did have him as one of my breakout candidates this year, but this is not anything close to the way I thought he would get it done. Because Tongu, you know, before this, I was just really impressed by, by his launch angle and his, you know, exit velos. He can really smack the crap out of the ball and hit it a long ways, but I thought he'd be more like a 240 hitter with maybe like a, you know, a 340 on base and then like a, a 500 slug. Instead, he somehow wins the batting title. Really good, you know, bat to ball skills. Um, and I think, yeah, he probably sacrificed a little bit of his, his raw power for that, but uh, but ultimately he established himself as one of the best overall hitters in the league. And unfortunately, he got hurt here in September, so so I don't know if he's going to be ready for the playoffs. Uh, but yeah, him and Mori were really uh, carrying the offensive load in the middle of the lineup. Yutaro Sugimoto uh, finishes with 16 home runs as well in um, you know limited playing time because he was hurt for a little bit. Uh, 723 OPS. And I think this is just who Sugimoto is now. Um, for the first, you know, big chunk of his career, he was up and down between the farm, didn't really do much. Then he has that huge 2021 where he wins the home run title with 32 bombs and like a 900 OPS. He was an MVP candidate that year. So uh, I thought Sugimoto had really turned a corner, but these past two years, this is basically what he's been. He's a low on base guy that can run into, you know, 15 bombs a year, which is definitely valuable. Um, but when you're not playing great defense in the outfield um, and, you know, the DH spot isn't really available to him all the time because of Tomei Amori and uh, Leandro Cedeno, um, it becomes really hard to sort of integrate him as an everyday player. Um, so, you know, he's basically just kind of a, a dangerous hitter at this point. Tokumasa Chano um, as a rookie, 560 OPS, so, so not great. Uh, but played really good defense. I think he led the team in ultimate zone rating. Uh, Marwin Gonzalez, 650 OPS, 12 home runs. You know, not great on paper, but honestly, one of the one of the better uh, foreign imports this season, simply because he can play all around the diamonds. So he gave them, you know, defensive flexibility. Uh, Tomoya Noguchi, a rookie, really good numbers down on the farm. He definitely has some some pop uh, at the top level. Not really showing it yet. But I think he has some some promise for sure. Frank Schwindel really struggled. Uh, unfortunately, I thought he'd be a guy that that really is able to to break through. Um, but it was more Leandro Cedeno. He had a stretch there, I think, in July where you know he had like a 950 OPS for a couple of weeks. Uh, finishes the year with nine home runs. Definitely fell off towards the end. I think the league has figured him out. But um, Cedeno is a guy that didn't have much experience above Double A, whereas Schwindel obviously had. You know, a, a couple of months there in the majors where he was he was great. So it really shows you that MLB experience, yeah, of course it means something. Uh, but in terms of predicting how well someone's going to do in MPB, why not take a risk on a guy like Cedeno, who's very who's much younger um, and, and probably the best years are are ahead of him, not behind him. But for the Buffaloes overall, they had Mori and Tongu, uh, who were great. They had Nakagawa, who, who was good. Kuribayashi was good. And then everyone else just kind of, you know, did their job. Uh, and it's kind of incredible that they won the pennant by so many games when they had pretty much no set second baseman for the entire year. I mean, they had Gibo play there sometimes. They had uh, Ryo Ota play there uh, quite a bit. And I think he's going to be the second baseman of the future. You know, Roichi Adachi, the veteran. Uh, he wasn't really getting it done this year. So they had very little stability at second base. Uh, and even left field, they didn't really have a constant presence there. But they were not they were unfazed by it completely. Uh, and a big part of that, of course, is because their pitching is just so good. So who cares about hitting when, when your pitching is the most dominant in, in all of Japan? Yoshinobu Yamamoto, his final year in Japan before he, you know, gets paid... Uh, by a major league team, 164 innings, a 1-2-1 ERA, uh, 169 strikeouts. He won the Triple Crown for the third straight year, uh, 9.3 Ks per nine, 1.5 walks, walks per nine, but this is the big one, 0.1 home runs per nine, only gave up two dingers all year, uh, and I don't think he gave one up after July. So, you know, he was good early on, but... I always say Yamamoto is more of a of a second half pitcher, 
because these these past couple of years, you know, he would go into you know the summer months with with like a two ERA, but then he finishes the year with like a with like a one point five, and this year he just took that to the extreme. He had a streak of something like forty five straight innings right around when he threw that no hitter against the Marines, where he didn't give up a single run. Uh, and he finishes with one of the best earned run averages in MPB history. Uh, and he had a, a, and this was another seven war campaign for him as well. So, so Yoshinobu Yamamoto, far and away the best pitcher in MPB right now. Uh, and even if you adjust his ERA to, you know, fit a more standard run environment, it's still well below a, a two ERA. So, just absolutely incredible stuff. Hiroya Miyagi, a 2.27 ERA, uh, good ratios as well. You know, he is the left-handed ace of this team. You know, he's only 21 years old, did very well for Samurai Japan as well. And I think the Buffaloes uh, are fine with getting, you know, posting Yamamoto because they have Miyagi. But, you know, maybe if they only had Miyagi, they would still feel a little bit iffy about it. But it's the fact that Shunpei Yamashita, 20 years old, broke out this year that I think is going to is going to really make this transition seamless for them next year uh, when you have Yamashita and Miyagi as, as your 1 and 2. Uh, he had a 1-6-1 ERA this season across 95 innings, 101 punch-outs. Uh, he only gave up two home runs as well. And uh, yeah, I mean, Yamashita, he, right in his very last start before he got hurt, ended up throwing 100 miles per hour as well. So, so Yamashita, I wouldn't say he came out of nowhere because he was definitely on my radar as a potential Rookie of the Year candidate, but you know he had like a 5 ERA on the farm just two years ago uh, as a rookie. So a really you know rapid development path for him. Uh, and the Buffaloes are very good with that as you, as you have seen with you know the likes of Miyagi and now Yamashita. Uh, so uh, I don't know if he's going to be ready for the postseason either. Probably not, because they don't want to push him. But either way, you know, he'll come back next year, and yeah, he's going to be lights out, because he was basically, if we're praising Roki Sasaki, then we should definitely be praising uh, Shinpei Yamashita. Uh, Sachi Yamasaki, good innings eater for this team. You know, he's going to be a free agent this year, so we'll see where he ends up. Taisuke Yamaoka started the year in the rotation, as he always does, but ends up being a reliever to kind of reinforce that bullpen um, towards the last couple of months of the season. And that just shows you how much flexibility and depth that the Buffaloes have, that, that they could move Yamaoka, one of their best pitchers, into the bullpen. Uh, because Daiki Tajima, they have in the rotation. Kohei Azuma came out of nowhere and, and ended up posting a 2.06 uh, in eight starts. Um, and they had Jacob Wagaspak tried out in the rotation for a little bit. Uh, Ryuhei Sotani, a rookie who I think is poised for a huge breakout season next year. You know, he was kind of a, a, an opener or a short starter um, when they tried him out in the rotation this year, but still really impressive. Gerald Cotton had a few starts in the rotation as well. So, so they just have so much depth. And then you look at the bullpen. So Ichiro Yamazaki, his ERA doubled in his last outing because he gave up like six earned runs uh, when he had only given up that all year. Uh, but still, you know, incredible numbers for him. 10.4 Ks per nine. He's one of the hardest throwers in the league. Um, setup man closer. He kind of splits the job with Yoshihisa Hirano. A 1-1-3 ERA uh, at 39 years old. Doesn't really get many punch outs anymore, but uh, still gets soft contact. And he got his 250th career save between MLB and MPB uh, a couple weeks ago as well. So congratulations to him. Yuki Udagawa struggled to begin the year. You know, coming um, from the WBC, he didn't really have much time to ramp up. So he, he was really struggling, especially with the command. But ends up posting a 177 uh, anyway. 10.2 Ks per nine. Walks are really high, obviously. Uh, but... When you're not really giving up any hits, 4.3 hits per nine, it's all right. You, you can get away with that and kind of be, you know, I guess like a Dylan Batansis because his his stuff, Udagawa's stuff is, is really off the charts. Uh, Shota Abe had a really low ERA last year. I think he had a sub one ERA last year. This year, a little bit higher, but still, you know, a quality reliever. Uh, Yamada, Kojita, you know, good ERAs as well. Higa, the veteran, 40 years old, uh, good as well. So again, man, they just have so many good pitchers, and they were missing Ren Mukunoki this year for, for with Tommy John. Uh, he's one of their top prospects. So this pitching is only going to get better even after they lose Yamamoto. 
uh, and it's just really exciting to see. If you look at the chart, you'll see that they are, you know, by a pretty significant margin, number one in the league, good pitching, good hitting. Uh, they have a like a 105 WRC plus and they have like an 86 FIP minus. So, you know, 5% above league average offensively, 14% above league average pitching wise. And yeah, I don't know what they teach these pitchers in their pitching lab, but they definitely have a formula figured out for turning uh, young players and kind of, you know, for quickly turning a lot of these arms into studs. So I, I do think they are the favorites to repeat as Japan Series uh, champions again. Alrighty, now moving on to the Central League, and let's go in opposite order this time. So starting with the Hanshin Tigers, uh, they won the pennant, you know, pretty handily by 11 and a half games with an 85, 53, and 5 record, a plus 131 run differential. I mean, that is just really dominant. Uh, and we look over here at the Tigers, and we see that they had a winning record against every team uh you know the only team that they weren't you know completely dominating was the Bay stars at 13 and 12 so they probably want to face the carp um and not the Bay stars in in the championship series although i mean this team is so dominant at home uh that it probably won't even matter uh we take a look at their monthly records and except for june uh where they kind of fell off and they and they were passed up by the Bay stars temporarily uh, they were really, really dominant, especially in May and August, uh, where they were 19 and five in May, and then they were 18 and seven uh, in in August. So, um, you know, the Buffaloes were they were they had a winning record every single month, but it's the Tigers that really had these really high peaks um, that looked that made them look invincible at times. So, looking here at the Tigers, they had a lot of players that played every single day. So, Takuma Nakano and Yusuke Oyama didn't miss a single game. Koji Shikamoto got injured for a bit, but he was basically an everyday player. Teruaki Sato got sent down to the farm for a bit, but he was an everyday player. Sheldon Noisy, uh, Sayakinami. So, you know, manager uh, Okada really kind of stressed this sort of consistency and stability from the day he was hired you know wanting to have oyama be an everyday first baseman and not just you know moving between outfield and first base wanting sato to be an everyday third baseman instead of you know a, a right fielder third base uh and then trying to have uh obata actually wanted to, he wanted him to be the shortstop but it ends up being kinami who had the breakout uh so you know, Nakano is a really good table setter, 350 on base. He was obviously the backup shortstop on Samurai Japan, 20 stolen bases. Oyama might win MVP this year because MPB likes to give out the MVP to, to the best player on the best team. Uh, I think it's going to go to Shoki Murakami, but Oyama, he played every single day. He hit 19 home runs at an 860 OPS and on base over 400. So he would definitely have a pretty strong case. Uh, Koji Shikamoto. Though I think a lot of Tigers fans would say that he was the X factor because, you know, when he was out with with a fractured rib injury, um, the the Tigers started to lose and the Carp caught up to them at the end of July. But as soon as Chikamoto came back, they got back to their winning ways. Uh, he slashed 285, 380, 429 this year for an 809 OPS. This is the Koji Chikamoto that I was hoping we would see uh, after a bit of a down year he had last year. Uh, his walk rate went way up this year, and that's something that Okada was stressing as well, was getting on base by any means necessary. Uh, and the Tigers really increased their walk rate. They had the best uh, walk rate, I think, among every team except the Eagles in, in all of MPB. So Chikamoto, 28 stolen bases, uh, only struck out four more times than he walked. Really, really good leadoff man. Teruaki Sato, despite, you know, a, a roller coaster of a season, as, as it often is for him, he leads the team in home runs with 24, had seven swipes as well, an 837 OPS. And in the month of September, he was by far the best pit, the best hitter in MPB. He had like an 1100 OPS. He was unstoppable. Uh, and so he's getting better every single year. This is his third season. First year, hit 20 home runs in the first half. Then he had a complete second half collapse. Last year, he was much more consistent all year long, but didn't really have those same kind of peaks. And this year... Yeah, he did have a little more up and down, but towards the end, he really proved what he's capable of. And he also upped his walk rate significantly, lowered his chase rate. So I think Sato is really a year away from going completely 
uh, supernova and having like a 40 homer campaign like Alex Ramirez predicts. Uh, Sheldon Noisy was really bad for the first couple of months of the season and I couldn't believe that they kept hitting him third in the lineup despite his underwhelming production. But credit to him, you know, he was playing left field, which isn't really his natural position. He's more of an infielder. Uh, and he got better as the year went on. The overall numbers are still not great, but uh, I think they just kind of wanted a guy there that can pass the baton on to the next guy. So uh, if you're going to put him in the bottom of the, of the lineup and he's dangerous, you know, he can run into one. Uh, not bad at all. Uh, I was skeptical about Nakano moving from shortstop to, to second base, but uh, with Kinami stepping up, it ended up not mattering. Shota Marishita also was my rookie of the year prediction, and for the first half of the season, it did not look like it was happening at all, but then he won the fresh all-star game MVP, which is kind of like the futures game, came back up, and he was tearing it up. Uh, at points and he had a lot of big time home runs as well he had one off trevor bauer he had two walk-offs this year so ends up finishing with an ops just under 700 and uh if you just look at his numbers past like july they're gonna be really good so i think marishta had a really good rookie campaign went to the same college as shugo maki and maybe he can reach those same kind of uh heights in in the near future and then at catcher, of course, they had Ryutaro Umeno there for, for the majority of the season. He's their primary guy, but then he got hurt. So then they went with uh, Seishiro Sakamoto, who, you know, similarly isn't much of a hitter, but his defense, I think, is even better than Umeno. And a lot of the advanced numbers like defensive runs saved uh, and, and framing runs back that up. All right, now let's go over to the pitching. And much like the Buffaloes, that is their main strength. So Masashi Ito leads the way with 146 and two-thirds innings. He had a 2.39 uh, ERA. Uh, he's more of a finesse guy, but but he's really good. Uh, and then they have Shoki Murakami, who is going to be Rookie of the Year for sure, and maybe even the MVP of this team. 144 and a third innings, a 1.75 ERA, uh, under a walk per inning, 8.5 strikeouts per nine, uh, not giving up any hits or home runs either. Murakami just coming out of nowhere. And, you know, if you look at the advanced numbers, this was no fluke. You know, even by things like FIP and XFIP, he was a, a top five pitcher in the league, right up there with the likes of Yamamoto, Sasaki, and Yamashita. So Shoki Murakami, at 25 years old, has really established himself a, as a true ace. Although, he struggled in the All-Star game, which obviously doesn't matter, but uh, I'm curious to see how he does in the postseason because of it. Kotaro Otake... Uh, brought over from the Hawks in the active player draft, and he had a huge year as well, a 2.26 ERA. Uh, for a while there, it was like 1.5. He was competing with, with Roki Sasaki for the lowest ERA in MPB. Another guy that doesn't walk anybody. Um, pure finesse, so not really many strikeouts, but you know, guys like Ito and Otake, these kind of soft contact merchants are perfect for Koshien Stadium. Uh, because of that all dirt infield, it makes any kind of ground ball die. Uh, Hiroto Saiki though, a 182 ERA across 118 and two thirds, really good ratios as well. Uh, I think he deals with fatigue at times, like he would have outings where, you know, he throws a complete game shutout with a whole bunch of strikeouts, then comes back the next few starts and, and he clearly isn't the same, just not really um, pounding the zone as much and not getting as many strikeouts. So um, he's going to have to work on that, but in terms of his raw stuff pound for pound i think he's one of the best in the league and if you just look at pitchers with uh, 115 innings i think he had the third or fourth lowest era in the league and he really made up for the fact that koyo aoyagi who was regarded as the ace of this team coming into the year he really struggled he had a 457 era across 100 innings um the walk rate was way up for him you know 3.4 He's not really a submariner, but he's kind of a low sidearm delivery. So uh, I always kind of feared that he would eventually have a season like this where uh, all the luck goes against him. But, you know, he was so consistent for so many years that I started to buy into the idea that he's going to be consistently overperforming his, his peripherals. And this season just wasn't it for him. I still think he's a really good pitcher, uh, but he's probably not even going to be uh, in, in the playoff rotation. So... Uh, a bad year for him, for sure. Uh, and then you have the two Nishis, Yuki Nishi and, Ju and Junya Nishi. Neither of them were particularly good, but I'm higher on, on Junya Nishi, obviously, because he's 21. Uh, and I, I do think he has good stuff, even though it doesn't really show in the numbers yet. 
Uh, but then you go to the relievers. Seguro Iwazaki, a 177 ERA, 35 saves. Uh, he showed up big time. This was probably his best career season yet, and he's had he's had some really good relief seasons uh, before. And it was really important for for him to step up because Atsuki Yuasa, who was supposed to you know be the closer, he got hurt and, and didn't end up pitching a single game after after June. So uh, Iwazaki sliding over from setup man, he played a, a huge role for this team, stabilizing things in the back end. And then they just have a bunch of guys that just quietly had really good years. Ren Kajia, Yuta Iwasada, Daichi Ishii, Hiroya Shimamoto. Um, and then, you know, even younger guys like uh, Masaki Oyokawa showed a lot of promise. Um, uh, Takuma Kirishiki tried out in the rotation a little bit, didn't really make it there, but as a reliever, very good. Uh, M Masumi Hamachi was great in 2022, not so good this year. Uh, but basically everyone else, I mean, Kyle Keller, um, Another good season for him, although he didn't play much. Kosuke Baba had a strikeout per inning. Uh, Jeremy Beasley was kind of a swingman. Started out in the in the bullpen, then he moved to the rotation. Um, did fairly well, you know, 2-2-0 ERA. Uh, Colton Brewer came late in the year to kind of, you know, strengthen the bullpen. He did very well as well. Great strikeout rate. So the Tigers have a really good mix, I think, between these like high-end pitchers like Murakami and, and Saiki, who can really beat you with stuff. They have the finesse guys like Ito and Otake, uh, and I mean, I guess Aoyagi when he's on. Uh, and then even in the bullpen, you know, they have they have the Iwazakis of the world, but they also have this depth where where even if their best relievers are not available on a certain day, their their B team can come in and still beat you. Uh, and that's why this team was the best in the league at preserving uh, late leads. And we look here at the chart. And they are right next to the Buffaloes. The, the hitting isn't as good. Uh, they had like a 101, 102 WRC plus, but the pitching was was almost equally as good. I think they had a 90 FIP minus, so 10% uh, above league average. And yeah, they pitch even better at home than on the road. So they are going to be a really tough team to take down uh, this postseason. And I'm excited for the all Kansai clash between uh, Oryx and Hanshin uh, if we do indeed get that. All right, now the carp. The carp went 74, 65, and four, finished 11 and a half back of the Tigers with a negative 15 run differential, and yet they were in second place. So how did they do it? Uh, well, I would say really good management by first-year manager uh, Takahiro Arai definitely helped. But as you can see here, they had a winning record against every team except Hanshin, who they uh, did very poorly against. But especially against the Giants, they went 17 and eight against them. And that played a huge role uh, in them finishing in second place. Go to their monthly record, 500 for the first couple of months, then 14 and 9 in June, 13 and 8 in July, uh, 13 and 11 in August. So they were so they were just a little bit over 500 every month. Fell off a little bit in September and October, but that was enough to get them the two seed. Although if the Bay Stars had won their very last game, they would have had the three seed. But either way, very good job here by by the Carp. Uh, on paper, this was definitely not a team I thought could make the playoffs, um, let alone finish in second place. I thought this would be a fifth or a sixth place team for sure. Rosuke Kikuchi, veteran second baseman. Uh, he definitely is not giving much offensively, but still plays really good defense at second base. Shogo Akiyama, it appeared like he was having a big resurgence for the first month. He was hitting close to 400, but then after that, he pretty much did nothing. Although in September, he was, he was a little bit better. So overall, he ends up with a 709 OPS. Uh, on base, a little bit low, um, for, for especially for a player of his caliber and in, in his resume. But um, again, he was good enough. Shogo Sakakura, I have touted him in the past as a guy that has a potential to become the face of this franchise. Um, a little bit of inconsistency this year, but overall, 266, 347, 410, 757 OPS, 12 home runs uh, while playing catcher, so that's a very valuable player. Roman Ishikawa uh, hit 305. There was a time when he was competing for the batting title. Uh, although he was quite a bit behind Toshiro Miyazaki, but there was a world where he could have won the batting title, but then he got hurt, and then he just really wasn't the same the last couple of months, but uh, still a good season for him. Walk rate a little bit lower than it usually is, but uh, he he's a guy that is very much a, a good pure hitter. 
Matt Davidson certainly had a, a wacky uh, debut season. 19 home runs despite hitting just 210 and, and having a 273 on base. Uh, obviously led the team by a pretty significant margin. Uh, 700 OPS. So, you know, there was a time when he kind of lost his, his job at third base, but he was able to regain it towards the end of the year. And I think having a dangerous hitter, a scary hitter to face like him, uh, towards the back end of the lineup is definitely crucial because this team really you know doesn't have many power hitters they're a team that beats you based on you know stringing together rallies with singles but Davidson's one of the few guys that can that can quickly clear the bases Kaito Kozono had a really tough start to the year uh, also dealt with injuries but really strong finish uh, one of the better hitters in the second half ends up hitting 286 315 on base 435 slug uh, that's definitely the, the slug part is surprising to me because he's not been a guy in the past that I that I've thought could you know really slug over 400. I thought he'd be more of a mid 300s on base guy, mid 300 slug guy. Uh, but this kind of shows you, you know, Kozono playing shortstop and third base. Maybe he can live up to the, to the prospect hype after all. Uh, Shota Dobayashi ended up hitting cleanup for this team a lot, uh, at least as a platoon player, which is interesting because he's definitely not a guy I've regarded a as really like a as a cleanup hitter by any means. Uh, I see him as more of like a bottom of the order guy. And last year, I think he hit zero home runs with, you know, like a sub 200 batting average. So uh, he didn't really seem to have much of a role on this team until, you know, this this big kind of uh, bounce back this year, almost had an 800 OPS with a 462 slug, which, you know, in dead ball era Japan, that is very, very impressive. Ryan McBroom took a step back this year, good good debut season last year with the team, but uh, wasn't able to do much this year. Shota Suikane, though, is a very overlooked player, I think, because he's already 27 because he was drafted at 25, but uh, 11 home runs in 65 games puts him on pace for like 25 if he played the full year. Uh, granted, you know, I think like eight of those home runs came against the Yomiuri Giants, who was just an absolute Giants killer. Uh, but still, I think Suikane, much like Davidson, isn't necessarily a, a great hitter. You know, the process at the plate is definitely lacking, but they're kind of like uh, quantity over quality guys. They'll give you the counting stats in terms of things like home runs uh, and, and, and runs driven in. Uh, moving over here to the pitchers, Aaron Curry, 174 and a third innings led all of MPB. So a true workhorse. He had three complete game shutouts as well. Uh, he did express MLB aspirations down the line, so maybe when his contract expires next year, uh, he can make the move. Although, again, kind of like Uwasawa, I don't really see him as a guy that would have much success. Uh, but he was definitely invaluable for this team, and, and it was one of his best seasons of his career here at age 31. Uh, Hiroki Takoda for the second straight year proving he is an all-star caliber pitcher. Uh, last year his season ended a bit prematurely with uh, a leg injury but this year he was able to finish it out and again he's one of these guys where the underlying numbers aren't necessarily fantastic but he consistently overperforms them. Masato Marishita, who is supposed to be kind of the true ace of this team, uh, he was coming off a, of elbow cleaning surgery in the offseason so he missed the first month. Uh, but then when he came back in May, he looked truly dominant. He looked much more like his rookie of the year form that he flashed uh, back in, in 2020. And, you know, he was the uh, gold medal game winning pitcher for uh, the Olympics. So Marish is a guy that's always had really high potential. Um, but he ran into a, a bit of a brick wall towards the end of the year. And I think his ERA was you know, in the low twos for a while, but it ends up finishing over three and he just wasn't getting many swings and misses towards the end. So I would definitely be a little bit concerned about him in the playoffs. He's not at his best form right now, kind of reverting back to where he was, you know, late 2022, even parts during 2021, where uh, I can see the stuff is there and yet there's something missing. He's missing that it factor that takes him to the next level. Uh, Daichi Osera, a veteran like Curry, these guys have been there for a decade. Uh, he was all right. You know, again, if he's in the bottom of your rotation, you, you feel okay about it. Uh, but after that, they really didn't have many, uh, you know, consistent pieces in the rotation. I mean, they had Shogo Tamamura, who wasn't very good. Uh, Drew Anderson for a while, but then he moved to the to the bullpen. Robert Corneal, same kind of situation. So, um, you know, in, in the playoffs, I guess it doesn't really matter. You know, if you have four guys, you can, you can make do, but... Um, the fact that they were able to scrape by this season 
without really having a, a clear-cut number five or number six. Uh, Atsushi Endo is another guy. Um, I, I was pretty impressed by that. And then you look at the bullpen, and Roji Kuribayashi um, was, was the big surprise early on because he got hurt in the WBC, and then he came back and was very, you know, underwhelming for, for the first part of the year. Blew a lot of saves, lost his closer job, uh, but in the second half, he was much better. Uh, that being said, he, he ended up finishing with just 51 strikeouts and 52 innings when in each of the last two years, he's been more of a, a 14 Ks per nine type guy. So it was a, a step back for him, but because he was able to kind of rediscover himself in the second half, I'm not worried at all. I still think he's one of the best closers in the league, won the job back. Uh, so Taro Shimauchi, huge year for him uh throws really hard you know 10 k's per nine two three one era he is uh, an electric setup man to have uh and then uh yasaki uh he was you know the closer for for the majority of the year for this team uh the peripherals are, are not good for him at all if you take a look at those ratios 6.7 strikeouts per nine 4.2 walks per nine and yet he was keeping runs off the board for for much of the year so i definitely don't want him in the ninth inning i'd, I'd prefer kuribayashi or shima uchi but uh, he's an okay guy to have. Uh, Omichi had had a breakout year. He's only 24. Nakazaki, he's he's one of the veterans in this pitching staff. Good year for him. And then Nick Turley, uh, who was really bad last year and, and actually one of the worst pitchers in the league according to to some metrics, came back this year and was an All Star, a 174 ERA, uh, really good strikeout numbers as well. So an important lefty uh, in a pretty righty heavy bullpen for them. Uh, Makoto Adua is a guy who I was quite high on. Had a pretty good run as a starter um, back in like 2019, I want to say, but then dealt with some injuries uh, and he just hasn't been able to to rediscover that himself again. But he's only 24, so I'm glad he's at least healthy and, and pitching. Uh, but look here at the chart, and that's when you really notice, you know, how much the the cart punched above their weight. They are down here with you know the fighters and and the lions. Uh, so they should, you know, in, in theory, be like in fifth place or sixth place, according to WRC plus and FIP minus, which is stack, which is measuring how they stack up against their peers. And yet they were in second place. So I think you have to credit. So I think you have to credit Arai, the coaching staff, and obviously the players for punching way above their weight and, you know, posting a winning record despite having a negative run differential. So winning a lot of tight games. Uh, really solid fundamentals and defense as well. Moving on to the DNA Bay Stars in third place, 74, 66, and three. They were just a half game behind the carp. They had a plus 24 run differential. And up until, you know, the end of Interleague, this team looked like they were competing for a pennant, but then it all came crashing down. They had a very good record against the Chunichi Dragons. They have, for the last couple of years, actually, the, the Dragons are their punching bag, but basically 500 uh, or a little bit below against the rest of, of the pack, so not particularly great there. Take a look at their monthly record. Got off to a red-hot scorching start, 16-7. and seven. That's when I thought, you know, this is their pennant to lose, but then big step back in May. That's when the Tigers had their fantastic month, so they got passed up. But they won Interleague, so then, you know, my hopes for them were up again, but then they fall off in, in July, uh, and then they finished fairly strong, but it just wasn't enough to make up for those two bad months that they had. So um, I think the Bay Stars uh, are definitely a, a team that... Uh, are going to look at this season as, as a missed opportunity, especially considering that, especially when you, you know, consider that a team like the Carp that are significantly worse than the Bay Stars on paper ended up finishing above them. Uh, now, offensively, um, the Bay Stars were not bad, but they certainly could have done a lot more. Keita Sano, uh, this was his worst season, you know, in, in a long time. He only hit 264, uh, slugged under 400. This is a guy who... I expect to be hitting 300 every year with like 20 bombs. Uh, he's, he's done a wonderful job taking over for, for Yoshi Tsutsugo in the middle of that lineup since he left, but uh, this season just wasn't really able to get it going. Uh, batted leadoff for a while. I'm not sure if that was the best spot for him, uh, but anyway, he's hurt now, so it doesn't even matter. Shugo Maki, though, the superstar that he is, he is Mr. Consistency. Uh, career high 29 home runs. He actually did hit 30. But that game ended up getting rained out before the fifth inning, so it got rescheduled and it didn't count. But, you know, I, I, I want to give my man the credit for, you know, hitting his 30 home runs. He also had 100 RBIs. 
uh, and he slashed 293, 337, 530 for an 867 OPS. Uh, the walk rate is is down. Uh, he's not really a guy that draws many walks. It's like he has like a 5% walk rate. So the on-base percentage was, you know, maybe 15, 20 points below where it's usually at. But he made up for it by slugging more, um, almost 40 doubles as well. So, you know, Maki, he's one of these guys that is just very consistent in his approach. This is his third straight season doing exactly this. So he's quickly turning into one of the best players in the league. And his defense at second base improved significantly as well, both in terms of, you know, advanced metrics, ultimate zone rating, and the eye test. His range up the middle uh, and with diving plays just improved significantly. Uh, Taiki Sekine had a great start to the year, but then he completely fell off, ends up with a 642 OPS. Uh, I'm pretty sure he was one of the worst hitters in the second half, so uh, really coming back down to earth uh, in a brutal way. Masayuki Kuwahara was all right you know he had a he had a really good offensive season a couple of years ago hasn't really reached those heights ever again Toshiro Miyazaki though wins the batting title here it's, uh, at age 34 hit 326 with a 395 on base 539 slugging a 934 OPS 20 bombs uh and as always with his with his you know kind of signature style only 43 strikeouts as opposed to 41 walks so uh 20 home runs with a sub 10 percent strikeout rate is just super impressive granted a lot of his numbers are inflated by the first two months of the season where he was you know hitting like almost 400 with a with a 1200 ops or something like that so he did tail off obviously you know that's the, those numbers were unsustainable but still a really really good year for him uh him and maki were really carrying this lineup neftali soto uh, had a bit of a slow start and i think this is you know every single year he's played now his home run totals ha have been dipping still hit 14 of them this year but i do wonder if this is the last time we see him uh in a base stars uniform especially considering that he's 34 but overall though i still find him as uh, a dangerous hitter to have towards the back end of the lineup kind of like a matt davidson so uh he's valuable in that sense Shortstop, they're still struggling to find, um, you know, a consistent guy there. Yota Kyoda came over from the Dragons in a trade, didn't do much. Um, Takuma Hayashi was one of their top draft picks last year. He couldn't hit at all. Um, Tatsuhiro Shibata played some shortstop as well, also not very good. Uh, so then they end up just reverting back to 35-year-old Yamato, um, who, you know, he's... he's who I think they've been wanting to move on from for, for the longest time, but because but because Kato Mori, their top shortstop prospect, still hasn't broken out, they're stuck with him. Uh, but something I was impressed with the Bay Stars this year what was their catching duo, uh, Yuda Yamamoto and Hikaru Ito. You know, that was this was supposed to be a main concern of theirs coming into the year because they lost Hiroki Mine to the to the Hawks in free agency. So people were wondering, you know, who's gonna step up behind the plate. Uh, Ito obviously not really hitting much, but he's fine defensively. And then Yamamoto is one of the best framers in the league, and he can hit. So Yamamoto at only 24 years old, um, I imagine he's going to be their main guy for for a while. But then they also have uh, top prospect Shion Matsuo, um, who you know is only 18 years old at the moment, but he hit really well on the farm this year. So if he comes up in the next year or two. Uh, and replaces Ito, then they have two really good young catchers. So that's definitely something to uh, look forward to in the future. Uh, and then the last thing here, the last point I want to make with their hitting is Tyler Austin. Unfortunately, only played in 22 games this year. Hit 277, 352, 404. This was mostly all during interleague when he had the chance to DH, but then he got hurt again. So this is his second straight year now, missing basically the entire season. Last year, he was reduced to a full-time pinch hitter. At least this year, he was able to play a little bit and hit pretty well. But, you know, he signed that big extension uh, a couple of years ago because he proved he is a premier slugger in MPB when he's healthy. You know, a 600 slugging percentage uh, his first two years. But because he is made out of glass and he just cannot catch a break, um, I'm really beginning to wonder if Austin has, you know, anything left in the tank. It's going to be really hard for him to come back from all these injuries uh, and produce. Take a look at the pitching. Uh, Katsuki Azuma is the big story here. 16-3 and three with a 198 across a 172 and a third innings. This is from a guy that missed, you know, almost three full years uh, with, with injuries. He had Tommy John surgery as well. Came back last year and was terrible. 
Um, so, you know, I thought the injuries had, had really tanked his career because he won Rookie of the Year back in 2018, but hadn't really done anything after that. This year, though, was a completely different story. Um, the strikeout rate isn't all that impressive, but he's walking only 0.8 batters per nine innings. You see this a lot with MPB pitchers like we've seen, you know, with, with the likes of like Masashi Ito and Takayuki Kato. Uh, the balls are much more easy to manipulate because they're pre-tacked, and so th the best command pitchers literally don't walk anybody. But yeah, Katsuki Azuma really re-established himself as the ace of this staff, which is particularly important because Shota Imanaga is going to be going to MLB next year. Uh, and he posted a 2.80 ERA, great strikeout numbers, 10.6 Ks per nine, 1.5 walks per nine, a slight home run problem uh, at times, but um, Imanaga had a stretch there from like late May to to the end of July where he was the best pitcher in, in, in baseball. He had a, you know, a sub two ERA and the strikeout to walk ratio was absolutely ridiculous. But he did struggle the last couple of months, had a pretty high ERA actually, uh, although some of that is bad luck because the peripherals were still good. So uh, Imanaga and, and Azuma, great, great uh, southpaw duo there, although obviously Imanaga is going to be leaving next year. And then you have Trevor Bauer, right? He had a 2.76 ERA across 130 and two thirds, got hurt uh, in, in, I think, August, uh, and he hasn't been back since, although there's a chance he'll be back for the playoffs against the Carp. Uh, and he ends up finishing with exactly a strikeout per inning, 2.1 walks per nine and one homer per nine. But most of those home runs came in his first two months because uh, he really struggled, you know, in his first couple of starts. Then he really settled into the league uh, and, and was a big innings eater. I mean, he had a 10-inning game uh, at one point. He had two complete games. Um, so for him to win 10 games despite joining the team uh, late, I think is impressive. Obviously, I have my criticisms of him. I think him blowing up at his teammates there in June. You know, people said, oh, this is going to fire the team up. Well, they kind of tanked after that, so I'm not blaming that on him. But I'm just saying, like, the kind of intensity he brings to, to the baseball field, that's not for everybody. Uh, but overall, if Ozma, Imanaga, and Bauer are all healthy and at their best, this team can definitely make some noise in the playoffs. Uh, Kenta Ishida, also going to be a free agent this year. Shinichi Onuki had... Uh, a slow start to the year, but finished very strong. One of the best pitchers in the league in September. Uh, Haruhiro Hamaguchi is actually going to play Puerto Rican winter ball this year, which is kind of rare for a 28-year-old. Usually that's something that uh, prospects do to get extra reps. But Hamaguchi didn't have uh, the best year, so he kind of wants to, you know, reinvent himself, I suppose. Uh, Robert Gazelman kind of lost his job after Bauer showed up. Uh, and then we go to the bullpen, and J.B. Wendelkin was a great foreign import this year. Uh, a 166 ERA, uh, good ratios as well. I mean, the walks are a little bit high, but he was keeping the ball in the park, and he became a, a shutdown option for them in, in the late innings, uh, which was important because Yasuaki Yamasaki, their closer, was very shaky this year. His strikeout numbers were very good, but uh, he just wasn't getting the job done. Uh, Hiromu Issei and Taisei Irie as well. Uh, these are guys that are, that are very young and they have promise, uh, but they're very shaky. You know, they're not guys you can always rely on. When they're on, yes, they're they're gonna they're gonna put up zeros, but uh, they're not really guys you can consistently rely on. Edwin Escobar had a really tough start to the year, uh, but he really figured it out towards the end and and ends up with a 4.55 ERA, which is honestly great considering that he had like a 8 ERA for half the year. Um, not sure if they're going to bring him back next year, but but still, I think when he's at his best, he's one of the most dominant lefty relievers in the league. Uh, Kohei Morihara ended up being the closer uh, for, for the end of the year. Uh, Kazuki Mishima is, is a great story, had a rare surgery performed on him, and, and, and it was named after him, actually. So he's been trying to make a comeback. Not really successful this year, though. Uh, Tatsuya Ishikawa put up a sub-2 ERA, and then Taiga Kamichatani. Uh, who has been kind of a swingman in the past, and, and even now he's m more of a bulk innings guy, uh, but really good numbers. So I, I think he's a guy that could uh, win back a, a rotation spot next year, especially because they have so many unknowns here, right? With Imanaga going to MLB, um, Bauer might leave, he might stay, who knows? Uh, and then Ishida is also a free agent. So I expect them to draft a starting pitcher for sure, uh, but one or two guys internally are probably going to need to step up as well. And I should mention uh, Kentaro Tyra. Um, 
he had some ups and downs, but he's he's always a, a pretty good option as well. Look here at the chart and the base stars. They're pretty much right in line with, with the Marines. They're firmly in the good pitching, bad hitting category. Um, you know, Yokohama Stadium, more of a more of a hitter's park. So that's how the weighted numbers turn out. Uh, this is something that's definitely new for them because they're much more used to having good hitting and, and bad pitching, but uh, that's how things stack up for the time being. All right, next up, it's the Yomiuri Giants, 71, 70, and 2. Uh, just over 500, but not good enough to make the playoffs. Positive run differential, but not good enough. And manager Tatsunori Hara has finally stepped down, uh, and he's handing the keys over to uh, Shinosuke Abe, a legendary catcher. So take a look at their head-to-head -head records. Very good against uh, the Yakult Swallows, 17 and 8. They play, honestly, some of the best series uh, the Tokyo Derby is honestly one of the more exciting series in MPB right now. They always play great games, but uh, this year the Giants dominated. They played well against the Bay Stars and the Dragons as well, but what really tanked their season for them is they couldn't beat the the, the first and second best teams in the league. They went 6-18 and against Hanshin, their main rival, uh, and then 8-17 and against Hiroshima, who, again, they should match up better against them uh, on paper, but it just wasn't uh, it. And then you look at their monthly record, and yeah, this is a 500 team. They are never significantly over 500, and they're ne never significantly below 500. So that's why they missed the playoffs. Uh, but when you look at the individual performances this team got, uh, there's a lot to be happy about. So Kazuma Okamoto, um, 41 home runs, wins the home run title, his first 40 home run season, and his sixth consecutive year with at least 30 home runs, ended up slashing 278, 374, 585. Uh, that's a 958 OPS. I think he was second in MPB and WRC+. For a while there, he had a 1,000 OPS, but he didn't do anything in September, so uh, really kind of fell off. But uh, it was obviously a really good year for him, and he was drawing a lot of interest from MLB teams as well, although that's probably never going to happen because he's the captain of the team, and the Giants are never going to post him. So uh, I expect Okamoto to stay with the Giants for, for his entire career. Takumi Oshiro, one of the best catchers in the league and a guy who I think is always underrated, especially among Japanese fans, because there's been this narrative that he's not a good defender, which is not true at all. He literally leads the league in defensive runs saved at the catching position. Plus, he can hit uh, 16 home runs with a 787 OPS. And yet he has 21 sacrifice bunts, which I think is criminal, not making this guy swing the bat and forcing him to lay down a bunt. Um, but it is what it is. Uh, Naoki Yoshikawa, um, not much of a hitter, but definitely a guy that plays fantastic defense at second base. He's one of the best defenders there in the league. So if you have him, you know, as your seven or eight hitter, then, then you feel pretty good about it. Hayato Sakamoto at 34 years old, still getting it done. He is very injury prone at this point. No longer the Iron Man he once was, but, you know, he's approaching the, the most hits in MPB history. If he has, you know, four or five more good years he definitely might get to 3,000 hits and this year he hit 22 bombs with an 884 OPS I don't think he's you know that guy that hit 40 bombs back in 2019 that was a total outlier but he has become you know an even better power hitter than he was early in his career um, as as he ages here and he's still you know a solid shortstop although uh, as I'll get to here with Makoto Kadawaki he is probably going to be a third baseman for you know the the, the rest of his career if Kadawaki is able to hold down that shortstop job because Kadawaki as a rookie um, he just was playing you know highlight reel defense all across the infield uh, and they finally gave him the shortstop position because yeah he plays it better than Sakamoto at this point and you know the overall numbers look a little bit underwhelming for him but consider that he's a 22 year old he posted a 263 batting average when he was hitting like below 200 for the first couple of months so he was great in the second half Kadawaki I think is the Giants successor uh, at shortstop and now Sakamoto can move over to third and Okamoto can move from you know third base to first base or left field and it allows the Giants a lot of flexibility. Yuto Akihiro, uh, 10 home runs is really good for a 20 year old rookie. He is the tallest player in MPB history at six foot seven so he really stands out because he's a literal giant um, but he didn't really do much uh, in the second half. In fact I, I don't even know if he hit more than like one or two home runs in the second half. Finishes with a 720 OPS. It was up more of in the 820 range for a while 
Um, for him, I think he just needs to work on, on hitting lefties because his splits are pretty extreme. He cannot hit lefties at all. Uh, so he was probably, you know, overmatched a lot uh, of these plate appearances. If you just look at his numbers against righties, he's very solid. Uh, really good, you know, power to all fields. And he's so tall, he does kind of whiff. He does, he is kind of exposed uh, low in the zone, especially in the dirt. Kind of like, you know, taller players like O'Neal Cruz or Ellie Dela Cruz are just naturally based on their physique. Uh, but Akihiro, definitely a really promising player. I can see him hitting uh, 25 home runs next year. Yoshihiro Maru, the veteran, uh, he had probably the worst year of his career. Hit 244, 316, 413 for a 729 OPS. Still almost hit 18 home runs. Uh, if he got to 20, I think it would have been like, you know, seven or eight straight seasons for him hitting 20 plus bombs. Wasn't able to quite get there, but this was the last year of the initial five year contract that he signed after he won those MVPs with the Carp. And he, he's had a fantastic career. He's having a Hall of Fame career for sure. Uh, and I expect him to, to rebound even as he gets older, especially because he's moved off center field, so he has less uh, kind of stress on it on his body. Lewis Brinson, 700 OPS playing center field. Uh, his whole thing was just kind of made a lot of dumb base running mistakes, where I think on two occasions this season he forgot how many outs there were, which obviously can't fly, but he also had a lot of clutch moments for them, so Brinson is a guy I definitely think they should bring back. You know, quality center fielder defensively and a guy that can hit for some power. Uh, and it was the emergence of Brinson that kind of drove uh, Adam Walker uh, onto the farm for the majority of the year, even though, you know, 758 OPS is, is very solid. But because Walker's very limited defensively, he's not even a good left fielder. He should probably be a DH. Honestly, I'd love to see him get traded so he can get everyday playing time. But uh, yeah, having Walker and Brinson. Are, are two of the better, you know, foreign hitters in, in the league right now. Uh, Takayuki Kajitani is, is fine, but he's always hurt. Sho Nakata um, for, the, for the first half of the year was really good. 770 OPS, 15 bombs, didn't play much towards the end. Uh, Hisayoshi Chono coming back to the Giants after uh, a short stint with the Carp. Um, veteran presence, and he actually did a lot better than I expected. He had a 760 OPS six home runs mostly as a as a bench player slash a platoon moving over to the pitching and shosei togo proving himself to be a workhorse yet again 170 innings a 238 era uh he was really good last year as well but this was probably his best year yet 7.5 k's per nine 2.1 walks per nine 0 0.7 homers per nine uh he is definitely a, a true ace and especially towards the end of the year there, he was completely dominating. He also had a 10-inning shutout, uh, but he was a victim of the no decision, much like Bauer and, and Saiki. Uh, Yori Yamasaki, 272 ERA, uh, and he finished really strong. So um, Togo and Yamasaki, both very young. They're forming a great one-two punch there at the top of the rotation. Foster Griffin and Yohander Mendez, two left-handed imports, were, were great. Uh, Griffin had some bad luck towards the middle of the year where uh, he got hit in the head uh, during batting practice and then he got sick the next week. So he missed a couple of starts there due, due to the, like freak injuries. But overall, a 275 ERA, uh, great ratios as well. And then Mendez, ratios are not quite as good, but the ERA, I mean, a 207 ERA across 87 innings. Uh, if they bring back both Griffin and Mendez, and I, I hope they bring back Tyler Beatty as well, because even though the surface level numbers are, are not great, um, he was really put in a tough position, you know, being the opening day starter for this team um, because of, you know, injuries to like Tomiyuki Sugano and, and Togo was coming off the WBC. Uh, but once they put Beatty in the bullpen, he did uh, much better. Kai Yokogawa, another young pitcher, a guy that I don't really think was ready to hold down a rotation spot. Uh, for so long, but he did a passable job at it, and the same applies for, for Yuji Akahoshi. Uh, so you see here with, with Togo, Yamasaki, uh, Yokogawa, Akahoshi, these guys are all 24 and under, uh, and, you know, Yokogawa and Akahoshi are definitely not on Togo, Togo or Yamasaki's level, uh, but there's promise there, and then Tomiyuki Sugano, the veteran, definitely not the pitcher he, he once was. Uh, he's dealing with a lot of injuries as well, but still, you know, if he's if he's your number four or number five now, then then that's not too bad. Uh, take a look at the bullpen, which is probably the Giants' biggest weakness, because other than Taisei, 
They don't really have a, a shutdown guy, and even Taisei this year, because he dealt with injuries, uh, just didn't really put up that great numbers. The strikeout rate is insanely good, uh, but too many home runs, and he was actually blowing quite a few saves. So Kota Nakagawa ended up being uh, the closer for, for the rest of the year. He was coming off an injury of his own, so you know, good job by him to, to settle back in quickly. And then Taiki Kikuchi, I actually think, is a very overlooked reliever because the strikeout rate's great. I love the stuff. Uh, the underlying numbers are much better than that 3.40 ERA would indicate, and he's very young. So I think Taiki Kikuchi and, and Taisei together, those flamethrowers could be a, a really devastating uh, one-two punch at the back end of the bullpen. Hiromasa Funabasama, one of my favorite names. Uh, I think he was a late draft pick last year. Uh, he was also solid as well. Definitely got better as the year went on. Good strikeout rate. Uh, Kohei Suzuki, they traded for him from for Oryx for uh, Hiroka midway through. And they just kind of wanted to have an extra arm there because they were really short on, on quality relievers. But uh, didn't really do a great job because he gave up two homers per nine innings. ERA was obviously really high. Alberto Baldonado, another guy that joined uh, midway through the year. Uh, slight command issues, but I think he was uh, good enough to to earn a contract for next season. Good lefty to have. Uh, and then we take a look here at the chart. And as you would probably expect, the Giants are firmly in that bad pitching, good hitting category along with the Hawks and the Eagles. They do play at Tokyo Dome, which is a band box. So that's why some of their offensive numbers look better than you might think. Um, and ultimately, I think the Giants had the right pieces uh, and the players to, to make a run. This is a really stacked roster with a high payroll. You know, Kazuma Okamoto hitting 40 home runs, Yuto Akihiro and Makoto Kadawaki kind of breaking out, uh, some positives on the pitching side as well. So if you told me all those things before the season, I would have thought that the Giants, you know, could have made a run. But there was just something missing either with management or just with the fact that they were missing those shutdown options uh, in the bullpen, and that ultimately cost them a playoff spot. All right, just two more teams to go. First is the uh, Colt Swallows at 57, 83, and 3. They avoided the seller by a mere 0.1% uh, percent in, in the winning percentage category. They had a negative 33 run differential. Uh, and the Swallows, you know, are a team that I watch a lot because I'm pretty local to them. And I have a lot to say because for a team that won back-to-back -back pennants and had championship aspirations again this year, it was a very, very disappointing year for them. The only team they had a winning record against was the last place Chunichi Dragons, which is kind of ironic because last year I think it was the other way around. They had a losing record against the Dragons despite them uh, being much better last year, obviously. Uh, we look at their monthly records. Okay to start the year, I mean right around 500, but then May and, Ju and June were just absolute disasters. They had a huge losing streak uh, at the end of May, bleeding into uh, interleague play in, in June. Got better in July at 12 and 9. Uh, and I think, you know, there, there was a time there where, where maybe they could have got their season back on track with a really good August, but uh, they obviously finished very poorly uh, as well. So uh, the Swallows just didn't get it done this year. Uh, where are they? There they are. Uh, and it all starts with Munitaka Murakami's really slow start to the year. Coming off of the WBC, he was in a massive slump. Yes, he hit that walk-off double against Giovanni Gallegos in the semifinals. Yes, he homered off Merrill Kelly in the finals. But ultimately, he was all out of whack during the WBC, just as he was at the end of the year uh, and into the playoffs in 2022. So there was something either mentally or mechanically not clicking for Murakami. And for the first month of this season, he was hitting like 160 with a 35% strikeout rate, uh, and, and it just wasn't pretty. And it took him a while to rediscover himself again, and it was a gradual process because he was, you know, getting better in May, but still not really himself. And then in June, he struggled again with, with a lot of strikeouts. But then finally, by the time we got to July, we got to see the, the Munitaka Murakami that we all know and love. And he finishes with 31 home runs and a 256, 375, 500 slash line. That's an 875 OPS. If you remove that first month of the season, it's an OPS well over 900. So I have no worries about Murakami uh, anymore. You know, for, for a while there, I was wondering if he just somehow magically forgot how to hit. But for him to have a down year and still finish second in home runs in all of MPB with 31, 
just shows you what a special talent that he is. Uh, and, and I know it was tough for him mentally to to know that his team was struggling and, and he was probably a big part of, of why. Uh, but, you know, the fact that he was so good late in the year and, and the Swallows were still losing, it tells you they had a lot of other problems. Uh, Jose Osuna and Domingo Santana remain, you know, two of the best foreign imports in recent history and by that i mean like the last like five years because so many uh foreigners are struggling uh at least on in the, on the position player front but osuna and santana are always contributing offensively osuna did hit 23 home runs which is more than santana but uh santana had the overall better numbers in terms of rate stats he slashed 300 361 484 osuna was 254 308 437 either way uh, they're both very good players to have uh, but then you get to a guy like Tetsudo Yamada and he had another down year he hit 231 306 415 uh, did hit 14 home runs missed quite a bit of time with injury but um, this is the lowest we've ever seen his on base percentage usually when his batting average is this low is on base is at least still like above 350 um, but you know in in three of the last four years now Yamada has had you know, kind of a step back in production with an OPS in the 700s as opposed to, you know, the 800s or the 900s, which is what we're used to. So uh, I still think Yamada is a really good player. He is, you know, at his best, a guy that's going to hit 30 home runs, play great defense at second base, but we are clearly seeing the athleticism decline and we don't know how many more you know good seasons we can rely on Yamada having especially as, as the injuries start piling up uh, Hideki Nagaoka at shortstop I think he deserves to win the gold glove award he is a superb defender but offensively wasn't great this year last year he he showed that he could maybe hit 10 home runs this year he only hit three and he had a sub 600 OPS so I definitely want to see more uh, with the bat although he's only 21 years old he still has plenty of time Yuhei Nakamura uh, this is right around what we expect from him. Low 600s OPS, great defense behind the plate. But I think the big X factor for the Swallows this season was Yasutaka Shiomi. And Shiomi only played in 51 games, and he was excellent. He slashed 301, 373, 500, 873 OPS. So him and Murakami's production was basically identical, uh, except Shiomi didn't play the majority of the year because he had, you know, two two really bad injuries that, that kept him uh, out for a significant portion of time. And if you just look at the Swallows' numbers in the leadoff spot with Shiomi and without Shiomi, it, it's night and day. Because when Shiomi's in that leadoff spot, they have an 873 OPS uh, kicking off the game. When he's not there, they're, all their leadoff hitters had a combined OPS of like 580, I want to say. So uh, not having Shiomi be a table setter for for a huge chunk of the year definitely hurt uh taiki hamada and soma uchiyama two very young players uh didn't have the best years i mean pretty much identical production but i, I think they're promising they'll, they'll get better nori aoki on the other end of the spectrum 41 years old still a 371 on base percentage mostly as like a platoon slash bench player uh but yeah last couple of years the swallows their pitching wasn't great but they would win off of offense with murakami with shiomi with Yamada with Santana with Osuna even you know Nakamura at times this was a true offensive juggernaut and many of us thought you know maybe they could get even better uh with some of these younger guys stepping up but instead I think Shiomi's injury and Murakami's slow start kind of ended up being a domino effect for the entire team and they just couldn't recover um but still more so than the offense their main problem uh remains the pitching uh, Yasuhiro Ogawa always eating innings. Good job by him. Sai Snead also not bad at all. Um, but these are basically the Swallows' two best pitchers at the moment. And they should be probably four or five guys in any other rotation. They don't have a true ace. We thought Keiji Takahashi would be that guy uh, because he has been excellent in years past and he was on Samurai Japan. He has some really wicked stuff. But he posted a 4.60 ERA this year. And again, he had trouble uh, keeping his spot in the rotation. He had to go, you know, up and down the farm, dealing with some injuries. He has not pitched more than like 110 innings in a season yet. And it doesn't matter how good you are. If, if you're not giving the team innings, you can't really be an ace. And this year, he didn't give the team innings or uh, run prevention. 
Uh, Reiji Kozawa, 25 years old, was certainly promising, a low threes ERA. Dylan Peters um, struggled towards the end of the year, but for the majority of the season was very solid. I hope they bring him back. Masanori Ishikawa, much like I said with the Hawks, uh, with 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 uh, Toyoshi Wada at 43 years old, he probably should not be getting 13 starts, but he did. Um, they were short starts. You know, he's not working much deeper than than the fourth or the fifth inning, but um, he he held his own honestly, despite having 3.1 strikeouts per nine and 10.7 hits per nine. He he maintained a, a sub four ERA, so. Uh, he's trying his best out there, but the old man can only do so much. Kojiro Yoshimura, their top draft pick from last year, coming out of industrial ball. So I thought he would be a little more MPB ready than this, but uh, didn't have the best debut. I still think he has promise, of course, but uh, he's not quite ready yet. And then they picked up Elvin Rodriguez midway through the year. I certainly hope they bring him back. He's a guy that really impressed in terms of like stuff plus metrics in the minor leagues. Also threw three shutout innings against the, the Braves in his very last appearance with the Tampa Bay Rays in July. So then the, the Swallows were able to poach him and use him out of the rotation. Go over to the bullpen. Noboru Shimizu, who's been one of the better setup men in the league these past couple of years, he was nowhere near as dominant this season. Still not bad by any means, but the strikeout rate was down uh, and, and he was blowing more leads. Uh, Naofumi Kizawa, I've always said, is a guy that has a lot of potential, only 25 years old. A uh, little bit of command issues at times and, and struggles to find consistency on a, on a game-to-game -game basis. But generally speaking, I think he, he's a guy that has a lot of potential to be uh, the closer of the future. Kazuto Taguchi, though, uh, did an excellent job sliding over into that ninth inning this year after Scott McGough left. Uh, the closer job was was a big question mark. Was it going to be Kaoni Kayla, uh, who they signed this offseason? He ended up not even making a single appearance on the top team, but it was Taguchi who stepped up and, and really kind of just improved every aspect of his game. He used to just kind of be he was a starter, then he was like a swing man, then he was just kind of a lefty specialist. But now he was actually a really good closer uh, and a guy that could, you know, rack up strikeouts too, which is not something I, I expected from him. Uh, after that, though, it does get a little bit bleak. Um, I mean, Tomoya Hoshi at 29 years old, I think had a bit of a breakout season. He went to a driveline adjacent program um, in, in Korea increased his velo significantly and even though the era is is a little bit high he had 10.8 k's per nine so definitely a guy that can build off of this season and become a more consistent uh late inning option but ultimately if the swallows want to rebound next year uh, i think it's going to take a, a number of things happening first off the offense needs to be just clicking on all cylinders as it was in 2021 and 2022 you know they already have half of that part down murakami osuna santana uh shiomi if they're healthy and on the field we know they can hit but they need yamada to step up again and they need some of the younger guys to to take that next step in their in their game uh and then pitching wise i mean it wasn't good in 2021 in 2022 so we know they can win the japan series without uh, a stacked pitching staff but they're certainly going to need at least one guy to pitch like like an ace whether that's keiji takahashi or maybe yasunobu okugawa finally makes his return he never ended up pitching for the top team this season maybe it's elvin rodriguez maybe it's kojiro yoshimura but right now if you look at the chart they were basically the worst team in the league both pitching and hitting wise uh because you know, even though the offensive numbers may look good, they play at Meiji Jingu, which is more of a hitter's park, so that the weighted numbers are going to drop. And then the pitching was just terrible. I think they were like 13% below league average uh, in, in pitching. Uh, so I am excited to see what this team can do next year. But if you go back to even the second half of 2022, this team just isn't very good. So uh, I wouldn't bank on them necessarily having a bounce back. And finally, we get to the Chunichi Dragons in last place. 56, 82, and 5 uh, with a negative 108 run differential, which was the worst in MPB by far. As you see here, they only hit 71 home runs, which is an improvement by their standards, but still is the worst in, in the league. Uh, that's the base stars. Oops. Let's go over here. They had a losing record against everyone except the Carp, surprisingly. And then by month, they had a losing record in every single month except September, where they were two games over 500. So, what is the problem with the Chunichi Dragons? Well, as always, it's offense. They can definitely pitch. They can't hit. Yukioka Bayashi, though, 
uh, had a 29 game hitting streak, I think it was. Uh, which broke a club record and almost tied an MPB record. So great job by him. He played every single game, 21 years old. Um, not a guy that's going to slug, but 279 average, 324 on base with great defense in, in the outfield. Um, he also has a hose of an arm as well. So Okabayashi, definitely a good player to have for this young core. And you add to that Takia Ishikawa, 22 years old, you know, former Koshien hero. Uh, he hit 13 home runs this year. Definitely showing a lot of promise in the power department, 27 doubles as well. He's a guy that can just almost never catch a break though. Down on the farm uh, in, in 2021, he suffered an injury. And then in 2022, he had, a, he had a season ending injury right when he was about to get on a roll. And then even this year, he was able to come back from it, but he got hit in the head uh, by, by, I think it was Kizawa of the Swallows, uh, right when he was hitting a bunch of home runs. So really unlucky in terms of injuries, but uh, showing a lot of promise. Of course, Nagoya Dome is a big pitcher's park, so um, couple that with the dead balls and, and a, seven, uh, a 676 OPS is, is not bad by any means. Uh, Yohei Oshima this year, 37 years old, got to 2,000 career hits, so so good for him. I kind of see Okabayashi at, as his successor in terms of, you know, very similar player profiles, uh, and, and maybe Okabayashi can, can learn under his tutelage, but uh, time for them to probably move on from Oshima. I mean, he was there when, when they last made the playoffs, which is a long time ago. It's over 10 years ago now. Uh, Seiya Hosokawa, though, was the main story this year. Another active player draft uh, success story. Only 24 years old. He was always down on the Bay Stars farm, uh, kind of in a log jam there. Couldn't get much playing time. This year, joins the Dragons, 780 OPS with 24 bombs, 30 doubles, proving that Yes, it is possible to hit over 20 home runs at, at the Nagoya Dome, even with dead balls. So, strikes out a lot, yes, but with him, with Okabayashi, with Ishikawa, they have a, a core to build around. And I would add uh, Hiroki Fukunaga, a rookie, and, and Kenta Bright into that conversation as well. Uh, they have the makings of, of a nice young core here. Uh, but a major problem this team faced was their lack of foreign production, much like the Hawks. Diane Vichieto has been one of the best uh, foreigners in the league for the past, you know, five or six years now. This year, he took a big step step back. Uh, Orlando Caliste did do pretty well towards the end of the year, so I think they might bring him back, uh, especially because he can play shortstop, but ultimately not great. And then, of course, the big guys, uh, Zoilo Almonte, he, he was a guy that could consistently hit 300 uh, when he was in MPB a while ago, then he went to KBO, then he went to Mexico, came back, and obviously has nothing left in the tank. And Aristides Aquino, everyone's favorite, everyone was saying he would rake in Japan. Turns out he had a 50% strikeout rate and he hit 154 with one home run. Uh, and even though he was being touted as, as a pretty competent defender, I definitely think he was not that great out there. Uh, so overall, a very disappointing year for, for their foreigner group. Um, uh, Shingo Usami coming over from the fighters in a trade midway through. He was really good, actually. Uh, so he's, a, he's another catcher option to have now alongside Takia Kinoshita. Uh, so, you know, on the Japanese player front, they, they might be okay, especially if the younger guys take one or, or two big steps forward. Um, then, then they have a makings of a pretty good team. But they're going to need to supplement that with some better foreigners, guys that can actually contribute 15, 20, even 25 home runs. So they're going to have a tough time this offseason, you know, going back to the drawing board and finding uh, guys that can do that. Now, on the pitching front, their pitching is always very good. Shinosuke Ogasawara, 160 innings. ERA is a bit fat, but honestly, I think he's a pretty good pitcher, especially when you look at the underlying numbers. Uh, I believe he also has MLB aspirations as well. Only 25 years old. Yuya Yanagi um, is always interesting to me because two years ago, he was the best pitcher in the Central League. Last year, took a big step back. And this year, uh, despite the 4-11 record because of the lack of run support, obviously, he had a 2-4-4 ERA and really, really finished strong. But he didn't do it in the way that, that I would have expected, you know, because two years ago when he was great, he was getting a lot of strikeouts. This year, pitching the contact a lot more, uh, but keeping the ball in the park very effectively, which was a problem of his last year. And so uh, he was able to kind of reestablish himself as, as one of the aces of this team to go alongside the youngster Hiroto Takahashi, 146 innings. He had a strikeout per inning, 
Uh, and honestly, I think the media is so tough on this kid, even though he's only 20 years old and he clearly has some wicked strikeout stuff, some of the best in the league. Uh, he did fairly well at the WBC as well, struck out Mike Trout. I mean, if this guy was in an MLB organization, he'd probably be in like double A right now, right? So shows you, you know, how quickly he's developed. And I, I think Takahashi, and he even adopted kind of Yoshinobu Yamamoto's old uh, mechanics this off season. So you can tell even at this uh, young age, he's looking to improve himself every possible way. And, and I think he's going to be a bona fide ace for, for years to come. Uh, Hideaki Wakui came over in that uh toshiki abe trade and he did hold his spot in the rotation all year but didn't do particularly well uh, and then after that you see a big drop off in in innings because they didn't really have many uh consistent guys there they had humberto mejia who came over mid-season uh he did fairly well although the ratios are not good at all uh kodai umetsu i almost forgot he existed dealt with a lot of injuries in, in recent years, but he came back, posted an 0.95 ERA across three starts. Uh, Takahiro Matsuba, uh, Koji Fukutani, and uh, Rei Nakachi, the rookie, are other guys that got some starts. Uh, but honestly, with uh, Yudai Ono missing basically the entire year, they I think they did struggle to, to find starters, to find capable starters, even though pitching is a clear strength of theirs, and you look at their farm team, and they have some of the worst pitching in the league down there too. And so we're in a situation here now where it's possible that the Dragons, you know, their hitting improves and their pitching stays the same, and and they become much better. But it's also possible that the hitting just doesn't get better and the pitching gets worse, and then you might have some of the worst teams of all time. So uh, definitely a concern for them and something they have to address. Bullpen, though, is very strong. Despite losing um, Yariel Rodriguez, their setup man, right before opening day because he defected Cuba, they were able to make do easily. Uh, Rydal Martinez, best closer in the league, 46 innings, only two earned runs. Uh, he had an ERA of zero up until like August, 12 Ks per nine, 0 0.8 walks per nine. Uh, just absolutely insane stuff. He is electric. Uh, Kento Fujishima, excellent as well. Whenever Martinez isn't available, he's basically the, the closer. Akiyoshi Katsuno, also very reliable. Tatsuya Shimizu definitely doesn't have uh, good control, but great strikeout stuff, throws very hard, you know, mid to high 90s. So I, I can see him uh, becoming the setup man for the long term as well. Uh, the veterans, Daisuke Sobue, uh, Shinji Tajima, Hiroto Fuku, all doing pretty solid. Uh, and then another rookie, Shin Shinya Matsuyama. A 1-2-7 ERA with 12.7 Ks per nine and not a single home run given up. Uh, Koki Saito as well with an 0-7-3 ERA. So as you can see, they have a lot of good bullpen guys. Uh, it's just they rarely get a chance to to hold on to a lead. So you can argue that, okay, maybe they're not pitching in the highest leverage, highest pressure, pressure situations uh, if, if they're losing. But still, for the time being, they have the arms. It's just they don't have the bats. I mean, a 6'10 team OPS, guys. I mean, come on. Even in a dead ball era, that is just unacceptable. And you look here at the chart. They are way off to the left. I mean, I even struggled to to include him on the chart. This is they they probably should be even further over to the left. Uh, they are about 15% below league average offensively, and by some metrics, they are among the worst offensive teams uh, of all time. I, I won't quite say they're the worst, but they're probably one of the top like 10, 15 worst offenses ever. Uh, but the pitching is pretty good. They're obviously up here with the Bay Stars, and, and they're a top four pitching staff. So if they ever figure out that hitting, then then they can maybe get somewhere. But with Tatsunami coming back as manager for another year, um, that is just brutal. I don't think things are going to get much better. Uh, but all right, that just about does it. This video is much longer than I would have hoped, and I probably rambled a lot more than I would have hoped. But that just about does it for the 2023 MPB regular season recap playoffs are coming up we have the two seed and the three seed facing off in each league the winner plays the pennant winner and then the winner of that plays in the japan series in late october my current predictions for the central league i got the Bay stars beating the carp then the tigers beating the Bay stars in the pacific i got the hawks beating the marines then the buffaloes meeting beating the hawks and then in the japan series um, you know, the injuries on the Buffalo side definitely makes things difficult, but I'm going to take the Buffaloes in a seven game series. 
Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe for more MPB content in English.